hearing. Gulf War veterans discussed their health problems and possible exposure to chemical and or biological agents during their military duties. This was the fourth hearing on this topic that Representative Christopher Shays, the subcommittee chairman, has held. This portion of the hearing is three hours. This is our fourth hearing on the illnesses being suffered by veterans of the Persian Gulf War. Since last March, when we began our oversight of the diagnosis and treatment of Gulf War veterans by the Department of Veterans Affairs, VA, we have learned much about the mis mysterious, often debilitating maladies known as the Gulf War Syndrome. What have we learned? We learned there is not one cause and not one illness. We learned many sick veterans are being told it's all in your head by VA doctors, while logical, even obvious theories of toxicological causation are discounted because the official, Department of the, the official Department of Defense, DOD, and Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, conclusions deny U.S. troops were exposed to any such toxins. We learned U.S. troops detonated Iraqi chemical munitions stored in bunkers at Kamasaya. As a result, it should now be presumed, according to the staff of the Presidential Advisory Committee on Persian Gulf War Veterans' Illnesses, that all U.S. troops within 25 kilometers of that area were exposed to chemical warfare agents. Just yesterday, we learned DOD raised the number of troops potentially exposed to Kamasaya to 5,000 based on information that more chemical weapons were destroyed in a pit area within the huge bunker complex. This is in addition to the several tons of chemical weapons agents cooked off and rained down on U.S. troops during the course of a number of days when Bunker 73 was detonated. We also learned that the DOD's Persian Gulf War Veterans Illness Investigation Team considers two chemical agent detections by Czech units during the first week of the air, air war credible. They conclude five other reported detonations of chemical nerve agents cannot be discounted. Apparently, they were trying. Two weeks ago, we learned that the investigative staff of the Pres Presidential Advisory Committee finds the Pentagon's denial as incredible as veterans have found them for five years. On September 5th, James Turner, the committee's chief investigator, testified, to fulfill the government's obligations to tell the truth about chemical warfare agent exposures to veterans and the American public, DOD's investigations must be timely, thorough, independent, credible, and public. This means devoting adequate resources, targeting investigative efforts appropriately, developing objective standards for evaluating possible low-level exposures, and informing veterans and the American people of the results of the investigation. In each of these areas, the advisory committee staff found DOD's efforts short of the mark and concluded, since the first concerns were raised about possible chemical warfare agent exposures, the Department of Defense, Defense's official position has remained essentially unchanged. That can be summarized in three no's. There was no use, there was no exposures, and there was no presence. The inflexible reassertion of this position in the face of growing evidence that there were possible low-level exposures, there were chemical weapons in the Kuwait theater of operation, and there were releases, has served to gravely undermine the credibility of the Department of Defense internal investigations. That is a powerful indictment which cause all of us, particularly those in the VA, charged to care for sick veterans to re-examine any factual conclusions or treatment policies based on the Defense Department's vi version of what chemical exposures took place in the Gulf. Finally, at our last hearing, we learned that even when forced to concede U.S. troops were exposed to low levels of chemical agents and other toxins, DOD and VA officials still d deny these exposures have any causal relationship to the symptoms of immunological and neurological damage being presented by Gulf War veterans. 
Dr. Stephen Joseph, Assistant DOD Secretary of Health Affairs, told this subcommittee, and I'm quoting, chronic symptoms or physical manifestations do not later develop among persons exposed to low levels of chemical nerve agents who did not first exhibit acute symptoms of toxicity. And that's the end of the quote. It is that proposition we will examine in detail today, for it now constitutes the Pentagon's last line of defense, the last barricade against the truth of chemical exposures and their lingering effects on Gulf War veterans. Unfortunately, today we will not have the benefit of testimony from the Department of Defense. After initially indicating a willingness to provide a witness, the Department declined our invitation, citing the unavailability of anyone capable of commenting on these issues. From my view, this tells me the cover-up continues. The Presidential Advisory Committee also respectfully declined our invitation to appear today, but offered to testify after the staff findings are adopted by the full Advisory Committee and their final report is complete. Nevertheless, we are very fortunate to have expert witnesses before us today. Each is an expert who, on the strength of hard personal experience, professional training, or both, will help us find the truth about the effects of chemical exposures on the health of Gulf War veterans. Our first panel, consisting of Gulf War veterans and their spouses, will describe those effects in very personal terms. They will also describe the toxic exposures so long denied, but now presumed, at least by the Presidential Advisory Committee staff, to have occurred. Witnesses from the CIA, VA, and the Environmental Protection Agency have been asked to discuss what we've learned about the probability and the effects of exposures to low-level chemical toxins in the de desert battlefields. Our final panels will describe their work as investigators, clinicians, and researchers to determine the causal uh, mechanism connecting chemical exposures and the myriad of symptoms and illnesses experienced by Gulf War veterans. We welcome all our witnesses, and we appreciate their help in our ongoing inquiry. You can be sure this subcommittee, you can be absolutely sure, this subcommittee will pursue these issues until the denials and cover-up give way to all the honest answers veterans obviously deserve. Now I'd like to call on my colleague, Mr. Towns, the ranking member and a full partner in this process. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by thanking you for holding this hearing. Our purpose today is to determine whether U.S. forces on the ground during the Persian Gulf War were exposed to low level of chemical agents which later manifested as chronic illnesses or symptoms. This is an important and emotional issue, particularly for the Gulf War veterans and their families struggling with unexplained illnesses, illnesses which may be the result of service to their country. These men and women deserve timely, thorough, and conclusive answers. We may not yet have those answers, but we should have the conviction to find them and the loyalty to support our veterans until we succeed. For the past five years, the Department of Defense has publicly denied that U.S. troops were exposed to any chemical or biological warfare agents in the Persian Gulf. The Department of Defense has declined to appear today because their findings on additional chemical detections and fallouts are still incomplete. I understand their rationale, but I strongly disapprove of their apparent failure to expedite. DOD's absence before this subcommittee may exacerbate the perception that they are withholding vital information. I look forward to seeing the outcome of the agency's efforts in this area. We must be careful not to arbitrarily link, link DOD's acknowledgement of chemical detections and the probability that U.S. troops were exposed to chemical warfare agents at low concentrations. To the chronic health problems suffered by some Gulf War veterans, Mr. Chairman, as of yet, the link cannot be scientifically or medically established. Nevertheless, these men and women are sick. There must be a cause 
and we need to find answers. For the sake of our Gulf veterans as well as our current military objectives in the region, the emotional impact of this subject should not be underestimated, nor should we, it be exploited. Therefore, I hope that in our search for answers, we are both reasonable and also responsible. Towards this end, I welcome the views of all of today's witnesses and thank them for the time and the energy and their hard work in preparing for this hearing. I especially thank our veterans, both for their presence before this subcommittee and for the sacrifice that they have made to this country. Speaking as an ROTC person, speaking as a veteran, and speaking as a legislator, I assure you that I am committed to resolving this matter. Mr. Chairman, thank, thank you again for holding this hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman, and before calling on Mr. Davis, I would uh, like to get some housekeeping out of the way and ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place any opening statements in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose. Without objection, so ordered. And I also ask unanimous consent that our witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record without objection, so ordered. And I would uh, at this time call on Mr. Davis. I'll, I'll be a brief, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would just want to thank you and Mr. Towns for continuing to pursue this matter. I'm also pleased to be joined by Mr. Upton, who was here for our last round of hearings, has taken a great interest in this, and Mr. Booyer, who's a, a Gulf War veteran, and, and uh, appreciate their activities, as well as Mr. Saunders, who's sitting here as well. This is really a bipartisan effort to get to the truth about the causes of the unexplained illnesses, really a statistically significant number of unexplained illnesses that have resulted from our soldiers fighting over in the Gulf War. The aim of this hearing today is full disclosure and straight answers, something we have not seemed to be getting by itself coming out of the uh, Pentagon. Uh, the men and women who served our country, who put their lives on the line, um, risked their lives for uh, our country, deserve no less than to get full disclosure, straight answers, and the facts. They fought for freedom. They defended our free society. They're entitled to the benefits of that, which is the truth of what happened. And I just congratulate this committee of moving ahead getting more facts uh, on the table and I think eventually uh, getting some resolution to this matter. And I once again congratulate you, uh, uh, Chairman Shays, and for uh, Mr. Towns for continuing to hold this and the fight for truth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, and I also want to, to praise you for your persistence in this very important issue. Uh, it seems to me we're talking about two important issues. Number one, it is the obligation of the United States Congress and the government to do everything that we can to understand what Persian Gulf Syndrome is. If we have 50,000 people who are hurting, who fought in the Persian Gulf, uh, we have an obligation to try to understand the causation of those problems. But the second issue, I think equally important, and I want to touch upon that in, in a moment, is to really understand uh, what the Defense Department has been doing in terms of not being uh, forthright with the truth. And uh, as you know, I have requested of you, and I know this is a difficult time because Congress is going to be adjourning shortly, but I would hope, Mr. Chairman, that no matter which party is in control of Congress next year, that we continue this pursuit. And that in addition to trying to get at the root cause of the Persian Gulf Syndrome, we hold the Defense Department accountable, and we hold those officials accountable who have not been telling the people of this country the truth. You know, there's an enormous amount of paranoia that goes on in America. Right about all the you know we heard recently, for example, some people were thinking that the Air Force blew up the TWA plane. Some of you may have heard that. Paranoia like that exists, it seems to me, when the government is not forthcoming and honest about what is going on, and we need to uh, get to the root of this. Uh, we must investigate why the information about possible U.S. troop exposure to nerve gas and chemical weapons, known since 1991, was not made public and was not incorporated into the studies about Persian Gulf War Syndrome. We must find out who is responsible for this very serious dereliction of duty and hold those people accountable. This cannot go on and on. The story has unfolded slowly, but it is becoming clearer that the Department of Defense inadequately investigated and released evidence of possible exposures to the veterans and their health care specialists. This is abominable behavior that has significantly contributed to the veteran suffering 
by unnecessarily questioning their complaints and perhaps even exacerbating their injuries by contributing to delayed or inaccurate diagnoses and treatments. In other words, we're not specialists up here, we're not physicians, but if people were exposed to nerve gas, certainly our medical researchers would like to know that so that they could understand that problem with other problems. So we have not been fair to the medical researchers who are trying to get to the root cause of Persian Gulf uh, Syndrome. We cannot permit this kind of behavior by the country that these very troops risk their lives to protect. Since 1991, DOD denied the possibility of Gulf War troop exposure to chemical and biological weapons until June 21st of this year. And DOD still cast doubts on claims that these exposures may have contributed to the chronic symptoms uh, that our Gulf War veterans are experiencing. Several weeks ago, the chief investigator of the Presidential Advisory Committee reported that up to 1,100 U.S. troops were exposed to the deadly nerve gas sarin when they blew up an Iraqi ammunition depot shortly after the Gulf War, and that the Pentagon's investigation into this exposure has been, quote, unquote, superficial, end quote. He recommends that an independent body continue the investigation rather than the Pentagon. Given the fact that some 50,000 soldiers who served in the Persian Gulf have complained of various ailments associated with that war, it is totally unacceptable that for five years the Pentagon denied that they had any evidence that American troops were exposed to Iraqi chemical weapons and nerve gas, which U.S. troops destroyed. Uh, once again, Mr. Chairman, I know that we're ending uh, this session very shortly, but my sincere hope is that in a nonpartisan way, we will continue this investigation and this work when Congress reconvenes. Thank you very much for your hard work on this. I thank the gentleman. I'm absolutely certain that uh, whoever is in charge of this committee will continue these hearings. Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll submit a prepared statement. I just want to thank you again for, uh, like a lot of members, for, for drawing attention to this problem. We all have constituents who have, who have expressed the concern, and, and I'm glad the Department of Defense on June 21 of this year acknowledged there was a problem. But again, like my colleagues, five years is way too long. Uh, we experienced this in, uh, with Vietnam veterans, and there is no reason why we should have waited this long to do this. And I'm just glad that our committee is continuing the effort. And I would hope that when Congress leaves this month or early next month, that we will continue these hearings, but that also the need for them won't uh, be as traumatic as they have been this last year because the DOD and the folks in charge will be actually doing the job that we expect them to do. Thank you, and I look forward to the, to the witnesses today. I, th I thank the um, gentleman. And with the committee's indulgence uh, and, and frank gratitude, I, I'd like to point out that we will be calling on Mr. Upton to introduce one of the witnesses after the witnesses are sworn in. But uh, I particularly want to uh, recognize and invite him to make a statement. Uh, Mr. Bouyer, who is a um, Persian Gulf veteran, who uh, took a lead role on this issue before this committee ever got into this issue, uh, who knows this issue better than any of us, uh, both from personal experience and from the work he's done. And uh, we hope that you'll be able to stay for some of, or all of the hearing, but we really welcome you and uh, invite you to make a statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have uh, two other hearings going on in a markup, uh, so I, I wanted to stop by. I wanted to stop by to thank you and to congratulate you. Um, the Veterans Affairs Committee and the National Security Committee is n will not be able to do any follow-up hearings on what's going on. So the timeliness of your ongoing uh, pursuit and inquiry, uh, let me stop by to congratulate you, Mr. Towns and, and, uh, and Chairman Chase and other members of the committee for taking an interest in this. Um, I, I have to also congratulate uh, my good friend Joe Kennedy uh, for all his work that, that he has also done. Uh, there have been several of us who've worked on the Veterans Affairs Committee on the issue, so it's not just me, Mr. Chairman. One of the things that I brought up, though, with, uh, with Stephen Joseph, Dr. Joseph, just the other day uh, in the Personnel <coughs> Committee, how upset many of us are here in Congress, Assistant, Assistant Secretary for Health Affairs, the Department of Defense, um, how upset many of us are here in the Congress and the American people when for so long, in direct answers to questions, no chemical weapons in the theater of operations. That's been pretty much their, their standard line. And, uh, you know, I, we will, the National Security Committee, will we'll jump in, in this uh, very soon when we come back uh, in, the new, in, the, in the 105th session. But I was going through uh, some things here today. So with your indulgence, if I want to share with the committee real, real quick something here. This is by Secretary Deutsch. Now, people, 
I was reflecting, individuals of whom in testimony before us have said no chemical weapons, <coughs> so this goes right to Mr. Sanders, what you were, you were talking about, came from Secretary Aspen at the time, came from uh, Dr. Perry, Dr. Ed Dorn, Dr. Stephen Joseph, and John Deutsch, who's now director of the CIA. I mean, these are high-level individuals of whom we must rely great trust upon. In the last hearing, Mr. Chairman, you had a very good panel discussion about the, about the explosions that, that occurred here. Uh, um, but you know, the, these detections around the uh, 17th and the 19th by the Czechoslovakians that the Department of Defense conducted these uh, discussions by saying, well, they tried to discredit those detections by saying, well, we had thousands of detectors out there. Sure, we had some positive alarms, but you know, nothing really matches here. And I'm going to read something real quick. Secretary Deutsch. I wonder, I wonder if someone could read into the mic just for the transcriber. Secretary we're... Deutsch, just real quick, and then I'll, see I'll reach let the panel. But this will to open up today that is really important. Secretary Deutsch, and this was on November 10th of 1993, okay? And this was in response to the Czechoslovakian's detection. Secretary Deutsch, the question was asked him, what about the attack on the chemical weapons depot in the area of operations? That's what we're talking about. This is back in 1993. The Under Secretary Deutsch, his answer, I have another picture I can show you of the attacks which took place at, uh, during this time period. All the air attacks are hundreds of miles to the north. Here are all the known uh, air attacks in that region. They are very far north. The attacks are hundreds of miles north. If you had a big chemical release at one of these air attacks, there would have been a large cloud with high concentrations reaching down into Saudi Arabia. There would have been undoubtedly been detections. During the war and after the war, there was a thorough search of all uh, of, all of the area, and no place south of Basra was there any location of chemicals of any type in that region. Well, now we know that that that's not, that's not very factual. Let me just share and enlighten everyone that's here, and I tried to share with, at the last hearing. This right here is at the tri-border mark. This was a large concentration of American forces as we all lined up with coalition forces. Right here, the, the Czechoslovakian detections were only a few miles from where I was located and thousands of Americans. The, the f oil fires at the time were over here in Kuwait and in this part of the area. The Department of Defense contends that don't worry about when we blew up the chemical munitions plant in Al-Nasiriyah and we blew up other, other facilities because the winds blow towards Iran. Well, if the blind, or winds blow towards Iran, if I'm located here and the oil fires are here, why am I in total darkness? Why was I in total darkness? At, at, it was at noon, and Mr. Sanders, I couldn't see you. How we far could, away were you from the, um, uh, the oil fields? I was probably... Uh, that would probably be a distance of 50 miles in the opposite direction. Now, how can I be in total darkness if they say the winds blow that way? It's, it's because the winds in that part of the area, they swirl. So I only want to do that by an opening to congratulate you on, about low-level concentrations. And your opening comment, uh, Mr. Chairman, about being multifaceted, let's, and I just want to caution my colleagues on this, because I've dealt with this issue for the last four years. Please. Please do not allow, permit the, the glitz and the glamour of, of the headlines of chemical weapons to overtake that, that the Gulf War illnesses are multifaceted. So that we have soldiers that were in Riyadh and Dharan, we have sailors out, uh, in the Gulf that also have other problems. So in our pursuits of our, um, uh, uh, of our medical science, it's, it's with cocktail mixes of inoculations, depleted uranium rounds, uh, airborne vectors that lay in the desert for a long time. But I think what you're doing here, Mr. Chairman, is, and this committee is highly admirable. A lot of our laws out there on environmental compliance, OSHA standards, deal with low level in industrial places. So for the Department of Defense to tell this committee that low level concentrations, don't worry about it, I think what you're doing is the right thing, and that's why I'm here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you very much. We're going to have a vote shortly, and I think what we're going to actually we have a vote now. I'm going to ask the witnesses to stand. I'll call on them, and uh, um, then I'm going to ask Mr. Upton to, uh, to make an introductory remark, and then we will uh, get away for the vote and come back and take testimony from the witnesses. So with that, I would uh, welcome Brian Martin, a, a Persian Gulf veteran, uh, Barry Kaplan, also a Persian Gulf veteran, 
Nancy Kaplan, registered nurse, uh, not in the Persian Gulf, correct? Uh, Nick Roberts, a Persian Gulf War veteran, and Denise Nichols, a Persian Gulf, uh, Gulf War veteran. And her, uh, Kimberly is uh, accompanying her husband, but will not be testifying. Uh, if we uh, were to call on you, it would be helpful to have your testimony. So actually, uh, if you wanted to just add emphasis to something your husband said, so I'm going to actually ask to, for you to be sworn in if you do want to respond. If you please raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. The record, all of our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. And with that, Mr. Upton, I invite our witnesses to, to sit down and, uh, gosh, you make me feel like I'm in the Army. I can order you around here. <laughs> uh, Mr. Upton, why don't you make your comments, and then we'll get to our vote. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would ask unanimous consent that an opening statement of introduction be inter uh, put into the record, uh, if, if I could. And with that, I'd, I'd like to just make a few comments. Probably of any veteran that I know, I'd have to say that Brian Martin has pursued this uh, to the nth degree. Uh, he has been a friend, he has been my constituent, and he has been unfailing in his quest to find the, the answers to this question. I regret the Department of Defense is not here today. Uh, driving across the bridge, uh, coming into work on WTOP, I heard the news that they were admitting, in fact, that four or 5,000 uh, Americans had been exposed to something that was different from their testimony in earlier months and years, and maybe perhaps... Of 5,000 additional veterans exposed. Maybe the stonewalling is finally over. I used to work downtown uh, for President Reagan and I'd often go to lunch uh, at that little park across the street in Lafayette Park. And the uh, statement uh, by Abraham Lincoln on the VA department was always a telling one, that the VA is supposed to take care of the veteran, his widow, his orphan. They've not done a very good job. Uh, today we know a very sad chapter about POWs that were left in both Vietnam as well as hundreds and hundreds perhaps in North Korea. And the question that I have to ask is, where were those committee chairmen in this Congress back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, who certainly had the capability but did not have the wherewithal to look into that sad chapter, into the sins that were committed against the folks that served so admirably in our armed forces? And I just have great praise for you and this committee uh, for your work uh, over this uh, past session and into the next session too to try and come up with the answers and help those that did serve and that we stop putting this under the rug and find the answers to help those that really need that help. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, and uh, we'll be at recess. Uh, we'll vote and return and then take testimony. Sorry to keep you all waiting. I'd like to call this hearing to order and to uh, suggest that we will uh, literally go down uh, uh, the table and uh, we'll start with you, um, Mr. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair Chairman and Honorable committee members for asking me to testify before you again today. I would also like to thank Congressman Upton for his continuous support and leadership, not only for the veterans of his district, but for the veterans across this country. As you know, my name is Brian Martin. I am 33 years old. I am a husband, a father of two, and a Gulf War veteran. I am also a former member of the 37th Engineer Battalion, whose last mission of the 1991 war was to detonate and destroy an Iraqi ammunitions depot called Kamasiya. Tal Alam to most of us was where the huge ammunition supply point was located in Iraq. There were 100 bunkers inside Kamasiya and 43 wareho warehouses located outside the depot's perimeter fence. When our unit received the mission to move into Tal Alam, our battalion commander separated the combat essentials and non-essentials for this mission. He sent the non-essentials back to Rafa, Saudi Arabia, while the rest of us moved northeast to Kamasiya. About 150 soldiers were used for this mission. On March 4, 1991, we entered the depot area, placing C-4 and Russian C-3 explosives in and around 33 bunkers. 
We set time charges for detonations, then moved south three miles to what we considered a safe zone as we waited for the anticipated explosions. From three miles away, we casually moved around taking pictures, recording videos, and writing home. At no time whatsoever did we fear or have reasons to fear chemical exposure. We were told by the 18th Airborne Corps that there were no chemicals in the area. No one in the 37th were, was chemical experts. Seven minutes later, the destruction of Kamasiya began. Getting excited as one could get witnessing these awesome explosions was a remarkable sight. The explosions blew straight into the air and then would spread at the top. Many of us joked that this would be the closest thing to a nuclear mushroom cloud that we would see or ever hope to see. But our excitement quickly turned to fear when cook-offs from the explosion began showering down on us. Several minutes, or I'm sorry, several missiles landed underneath our trucks, spinning and taking off until blowing up. Men were running everywhere for cover. Hiding behind our vehicles for safety, we felt all hell had broken loose. With the dangers of being killed by the cook-offs and the obvious giant clouds that were covering us, our battalion XO decided it was time to move us to a safer place to wait. The 307th Engineer Battalion from the 82nd Airborne Division radioed to us, asking that we stop the detonation because of cook-offs, penetrating their area, making it extremely dangerous to complete their missions at uh, Talil Airfield. Talil Airfield, Talil Airfield was over 12 miles away to the northwest, so our battalion XO decided we needed to move farther than 12 miles. 20 miles later, he found an area that had no signs of cook-offs to the southwest. Our battalion moved into con convoy formation and proceeded, proceeded to vacate the area. For the next three days, it rained harder than any of us had seen in the six months we were there. Our commanders joked about us putting something into the air to change the weather. The skies were dark gray and cloudy. Since just before those days at Kamasiya, I had suffered from symptoms and ailments that have altered everything about me and my family's lives. It started in early 1991 with blood in my vomit and stools. Blurred vision, shaking and trembling like I was on a caffeine high. My muscles were weakening, my chest pounded like my heart was going to explode through my chest. During physical training, I would vomit chem-like looking fluids every time I ran. An ambulance would pick me up, putting IVs in both arms and rushing me to Womack Community Hospital. My symptoms were simply written off as a stomach viral infection of an unknown origin. I was not allowed to advance in rank or tra transfer units due to my medical problems. In December 1991, I put in for an early out from the military that I had loved so much. I was told not to have children or gr give blood for one year. My medical conditions were ignored. Today, as I have for the past five and a half years, suffer from the symptoms that render me disabled. In a deranged way, I guess I'm lucky. I have some clearly defined diagnoses of multiple chemical sensitivity, inflammatory bowel disease with scarring of the colon and stomach due to chemical exposure, temporal lobe brain damage also with scarring due to chemical exposure. I have Reiter's syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, and tinnitus. I have a lower back condition and abnormally high levels of pH alkaline in my semen. I have abnormally high platelets around my blood cells and recently I was tested for lupus and Alzheimer's disease. From the first day I went into the VA, VA hospital in Battle Creek, Michigan, my records state that I was exposed to something of environmental contaminant during my service in the Gulf War. Recently, I went, underwent removal and biopsies of moles. I have had spots burned off my forehead, and a spot in the middle of my back is presently under observation. Surgery is being scheduled to remove three lumps that are in my thigh, stomach, and rib cage. Even more recently, the VA has removed me from the permanent and total disability list of which I've been on since March of 1996, forcing me to undergo all the compensation and pension exams over again. From Louisville, Kentucky to Washington, D.C., the VA computers claim that I am permanent and total. I have been approved for $30,000 life insurance from the VA, something that only a permanently disabled veteran receives. But one man, Bob Marks, who works for the VA Adjudication Board in Michigan, claims that I am not permanent or total. I was asked by the VA to apply for benefits for my family, something else a veteran can't get unless he is permanent. When I, argue, when I argued this with Mr. Marks, he added a mental evaluation to my exams and said that chronic fatigue syndrome is a mental disorder and not a physical one. The doctors that examined me in Battle Creek for these uh, CMP exams all stated that this was a waste of time and money for us all. With the help of Congressman Upton's office and hopefully this committee, Mr. Marks will be kept at bay. For the last five and a half years, I suffer from excruciating painful headaches, memory loss, and severe diarrhea. My family lives with my bad mood swings like walking on eggshells. I can no longer eat or drink many of the things that I used to. If I smell perfumes, vapors, or chemicals that doesn't agree with my smelling senses, I violently vomit. I get lost when I drive sometimes and forget where I'm at sometimes. I am an ex-paratrooper who needs a cane and a wheelchair to get around. My joints and my knees, hands, and knuckles swell, burn, and hurt. 
My feet burn and swell if I spend any time on them at all. I cannot sit or stand for prolonged periods of time. I am fatigued and feel worn out, but yet I am an insomniac. For all of this, except the chemical injuries and so much more, the VA has rated me in 1994 at 100% plus special monthly compensation. Then in 1996, I was added to the permanent and total, which is now being threatened. My rating is 100% for writer syndrome, 50% for chronic fatigue syndrome, 30% for colitis, 10% for tinnitus, and 10% for lower back condition. Nothing for chemical injuries or illnesses. Zeros across the board for everything else. Since the admission of Kamasia, I thought the VA would have taken me a little more serious. Instead, they're trying to take away my service-connected disability benefits, the only means of income my family has to pay our bills. Instead of outreach and compassion, I received a police report the other day where the VAMC in Battle Creek, Michigan claims that they are going to press charges on me for cassette taping a doctor pushing my wife on VA property. In conclusion, I would like to add that my wife and I have looked forward, or I mean, looked for the truth about our illnesses. My chemical injuries do exist. They have since 1991. They've existed for the same five years the Pentagon to the White House claimed that they knew nothing about Kamasia. They've existed for the same amount of time brave young veterans have died and scared young wives bury them. They're existing and we veterans learn to adapt them, adapt to them. Our pain has forced us to, to tap the resources of our spirits. My wife and I try to measure our intelligence not by what we know but by the way we view things. Everything we have endured for the past five years has taught us the difference between an obvious cover-up and corrupt disregard for human life. The Veterans Affairs simply put gross incompetence can be exampled by the right hand not knowing what the left is doing for using DOD's ghost documents and ridiculous memorandums as their medical care guides. I've wondered how civilian doctors treat patients without the Pentagon sending them a memorandum. It amazes me to sit back and listen to all the different excuses the Pentagon has for messing up Kamasia. Are they frantic because we were exposed to a terrible chemical and are ill from it or because they got caught denying it? After reading the memorandum, attachment E, stating that certain documents shouldn't be put on the golf link, I ask why would they want to hide documents from the press or general public that describe certain important events? They have made their own bed of cover-up and after the VA tucks them in, they must lay in it. These are the things that the DOD does to prove their intent to conceal proper information from the press, the veterans, and you, the United States Congress. I hope that these hearings and this committee can help veterans mold a new reality for the Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs. A wake-up call, if you will. The support from the press, Congress, and the American people is strong enough to convince these departments to listen to the veterans. If we are too ill or don't live long enough to enjoy the freedoms we have as Americans, what good was fighting for them? Thank you. Mr. Kaplan. Yes, sir. Good morning. I'm Barry Stewart Kaplan, a major United States. Mr. Kaplan, if you pull the mic fairly close to you, it would be helpful. Uh, the mic that projects your voice is the one on the stem. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to ask you to pull even closer. Thank you. Well, <laughs> good morning. I'm good. Barry Stewart Kaplan, major United States Army, retired, and I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. My dates of service in Southwest Asia were 16 December 90 through 19 May 1991. I was a support operations officer and a Black Hawk test pilot for 9th of the 227th Aviation Regiment of the 3rd Armored Division, 7th Corps. I understand you're interested in hearing some of my uh, experiences and perceptions from my service in the Gulf. Basically, one of the first questions was, what is wrong? It's real simple, sir. I can't sleep. I can't drive, can't run, can't fly broke helicopters no more, and I can't play with sports with my four children. That's what's happening to Barry Kaplan right now. Cause, I'm not absolutely sure, not sure at all. I don't know where it was or when it was, but I can tie a couple of specific dates and events. I believe it was chemical biological exposure. Too many animals and enemy remains that were devoid of any flies or insects. Plain and simple. It's not natural. However, our mess halls, all of our uh, ration points were full of flies. But why weren't those other two things full of flies? There were two major chem events in our area. One was a young private who was hit with uh, some sort of chemical compound in a bunker within the 3rd Armored Division area, a young soldier by the name of Fisher. He was awarded the Purple Heart for chemical wounds by General Funk. Plain and simple. 
Second event was by a warrant officer within 47 Cab, CW3 retired now Miguel Ramos. He claims to have seen chemical tipped weapons and shells within a bunker in the 47 Cab area. Where were we? Soldier of the 9th of the 227th and 3rd Armored Division did the full routine, sir. We were there from Dahran to the desert southwest of KKMC. We were downwind of Hafer al Batin, which was a major target for scud attacks. We were all through Iraq. Believe me, the 10th, 12th, 52nd, and Talakana divisions were not happy to see us. Republican guards did not like the 3rd Armored Division. Plain and simple, we, left, we lived for our last several weeks in Iraq. We lived on our last battlefield, and we stayed there. Amongst all the munitions, allied and enemy munitions that were still on the ground in the area. Yes, we had the smoke come from the left, smoke come from the right, from the oil fires. And we were downwind of the chemical munitions being blown up, approximately 30 to 40 kilometers downwind of his operation. Is that the time? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I can tie it to a specific event and a specific date. I'm not sure if it was a single exposure or a continual one. Late May, or excuse me, mid-late April 91, the vicinity of Safwan, Iraq, where we were doing uh, refugee retrograde actions for the fear that the Iraqis were going to kill the Shiites, uh, building up to a fulminating event on 9 May. Uh, I was leading a convoy from uh, K or two KKMC, King Khalid Military City, uh, from Kuwait. Uh, at that time, I had projectile vomiting, explosive diarrhea, and nausea at that time. Uh, I was uh, basically poured into the Saudi Arabian Military Hospital at King Khalid Military City, KKMC, and I stayed there for several days. Uh, due to some uh, negotiations, I was allowed to return with my unit back to uh, Hanau, Germany. Symptoms, too many to list, sir. Too many to list. I've provided an enclosure that goes over the majority of them. Uh, however, they were coming in distinct cycles. Now they're just part of everyday life. Let's talk about the tests. I think the tests that I've undergone are probably more telling uh, than the symptoms. Cardiac, echoes, stress tests, bubble studies, ultrasounds, heart casts, and cardiac biopsies. <coughs> Gastro, multiple endoscopies, colonoscopies, flex sigs, manometries, pH probes, liver biopsies. Dermatology and infectious disease, multiple skin biopsies, lymph node biopsies, multiple bone marrows. Ophthalmology, visual field tests, legal blindness tests. Neurology, spinal taps, EEG, sleep studies, sleep deprived EEGs. I have, there, there's some things going on, but I'm not the only one. I am definitely not the only one. The treatment that I have received at the VA hospital in Newington, Connecticut has been nothing but exemplary. I'm treated with respect. The doctors there, from my primary care doctor, Dr. Koss, all the way through the specialists I've seen, have provided myself and my wife nothing but excellence in care. Diagnosis. I provided your staff a diagnosis recap. And basically what that does in my enclosure too, it explains what the Army found from 1991 to 1994 is approximately 20 different diagnoses. The Department of Defense CCEP, Clinical, Compre Comprehensive Clinical Evaluation Program, reported one diagnosis for Barry Kaplan, and that was somatization disorder. My retirement physical, which I provided also and is in the handouts, list approximately 20 diagnoses, anywhere from chronic Q fever, hepatitis, myocarditis of the heart, just to name a few. That was in May 95. The VA hospital in Newington for my first comp and pension exam agreed with the previous results from 1991-94, my Army retirement physical, and added more. That was in July of 95 when I retired from the service. July of 96, just several couple of months ago, once again, the VA hospital in Newington concurred with all previous diagnoses except for one. 
the CCEP's somatoform disorder. Very visual, very graphic, bottom line. Something's not right. I never give a bunch of problems without a fix. And I'd like to give you, sir, and uh, give the other uh, honorable members a couple of my ideas that may help out, at least from down here in the trenches. Can't give both folks back their lives or the health. We can't put families back together that have broken up, and many have. There are many things we can correct. However, give immediate VA service connection to all veterans and Gulf War registries, even if it's for 0% disability. Service connect those things. That will fix the medical and compensation issues. Two, sick family members should be given an open enrollment opportunity for Champus and TRICARE, military medical insurance plans, at the regular premium rates, just like my <coughs> wife and I have to pay for our family. However, that will fix medical coverage finance problems for these family members who don't have the funds to do it. Thirdly, and this may uh, perk up a couple ideas, being that I firmly believe that this is chem bio warfare by a hostile force, is that we award the Purple Heart to ill Gulf War veterans. Purple Heart just like we did during World War I for chemical wounds, for suspected chemical and biological warfare by a hostile force. That will completely fix, once and for all, the government recognition problem and the perception this is being mishandled like Agent Orange, and now our atomic veteran problem. Sir, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, Ms. Ms. Kaplan. Hello. My name is Nancy Kaplan, and I'm the wife of a Gulf War veteran. We have four children who were all born prior to Desert Storm. Our oldest son, Jacob, is 12. Our twins, David and Ariel, are nine, and our youngest, Taryn, is seven. We've come to speak to you today about the damage that my husband's service in the Gulf has wreaked on our health, our security, and our dreams for the future. I've given you a chronology of the medical issues that have plagued our lives since the day I opened my husband's duffel bags in our small apartment in Germany. Within three weeks of handling the wet, soiled... Sorry, I'm sorry about you. I just want to make sure we're all hearing you, and it's a little okay. difficult. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Within the three weeks of handling the wet, soiled clothing, the two boys and I were diagnosed with asthma. Within the next three months, my husband was hospitalized in Saudi Arabia and again in Frankfurt, Germany. Our daughter, Taryn, was also, also hospitalized for six weeks after I stored my husband's bags in her room. She was 21 months old at the time. She had toxic shock, gangrene, and necrotizing fasciitis. Over the last five years, Barry has been medevac to Walter Reed Army Medical Center twice. Our entire family was medevac there once, and finally, my husband's orders were canceled for his next assignment, and we were transferred to Fort Meade at the recommendation of the Infectious Disease Department at Walter Reed so that we could participate in the government comprehensive clinical evaluation program there. Despite extensive documented abnormal results and tests, the CCEP diagnosed us both with somatoform disorder in October of 1994. Barry was evaluated by cardiology at Walter Reed in March of 95 and was diagnosed with chronic myocarditis related to environmental causes. The physician at Beaumont, which is in El Paso, sent me documentation of other biopsy reports that he had done that showed damage to the heart muscle from a toxic substance that the pathologist had been unable to identify. At that time, my husband received a P2 profile preventing him from being redeployed to the Gulf. He was still on active duty. On his retirement physical, as he said, his primary care physician documented 20 significant problems. They included sleep apnea, increased intracranial pressure, chemical hepatitis, chronic Q fever, positive Leishmania titers, degenerative arthritis, Barrett's esophagus, and those are just a few. Despite these debilitating conditions, the head of the CCEP, Dr. Raymond Chung, stated that he would support a 10% psychiatric discharge for my husband, and it was only through a waiver to the early retirement requirements for compassionate medical reasons that we were able to retire in July of 1995. Compensation and pension exams at our local VA hospital support the health problems related to chemical exposures. In addition to many problems my husband suffered prior to his retirement, we have recently been told that he has pseudotumor cerebri. That is 
um, a problem like you have a tumor, but there is no tumor. This has caused damage to his optic nerves, loss of peripheral vision, dizziness, numbness and tingling of his face and arms, difficulty with short-term memory, and a slow progressive deterioration in his cognitive function. We brought that, he had a spinal tap at the Mayo Clinic in 1994. We brought the information that we had from the Mayo Clinic that showed abnormal test results to the Comprehensive Clinical Evaluation Program. We requested at that time that his neurological evaluation include a spinal tap, and we were told that the results were not clinically significant. When this was followed up in the VA hospital in February of 1996, they did indeed at that time diagnose him with pseudotumor. They don't know what caused it. They don't know the treatment that he's on right now, which is diuretics, is not affecting it. He, I feel that if they had evaluated him during the CCEP that perhaps he wouldn't have lost his peripheral vision and perhaps the short-term memory loss and cognitive dysfunction would be less if they had attempted some type of treatment. Anyway, if I can continue. Um, our family continues to be plagued with numerous infections requiring long-term use of antibiotics. Just this winter alone, we have dealt with strep infections not responsive to antibiotic therapy, abscesses of the retropharyngeal areas, pneumonia, cellulitis, and viral illnesses requiring hospitalization for IV hydration. It is obvious to me that there was a significant insult to our immune system, which has precipitated these medical problems. I truly believe Barry was exposed to chemical or biological agents which destroyed his health and the health of his fellow soldiers. I also feel the children and I were exposed to the agents when we handled his soiled clothing. Our daughter, Taryn, is a direct casualty of the war. As an infant, she slept in the very room I stored his returning clothes and military items in. She has felt the effects of Gulf War illness as surely as any soldier. She continues to deal with her chronic abdominal pain on a daily basis and is very brave and has a stoic outlook. Despite the reams of medical records listing these medical problems, there have been no answers regarding the probable causes of these issues. Even after meeting with Stephen Joseph, Susan Bailey, John Deutsch, and Mrs. Clinton at the request of Dr. Chung, I continue to feel betrayed by the Department of Defense. Through their continued lies, cover-ups, and deserted disinformation campaign, they are perpetrating a fraud on the American people and discrediting the soldiers and their families. The cost of their cover-up is borne by the very men and women who have fought for their country, their families, and their friends, and the cost or the loss is too hard to bear. They count their losses in friends, in children, wives, husbands, hopes, and dreams. Where are General Schwarzkopf, General Powell, and the other commanders who have a moral obligation to their soldiers? I feel that accountability in this issue is very important and that the DOD, Dr. Josephs, the people in the VA need to be held accountable for what they're reporting. I think that the disinformation campaign that the DOD is doing um, has discredited the soldiers. And um, I have a whole bunch more to say, but my time's up, so. <laughs> Let me just say, I was asking a question when you made one comment. I just want to, you have how many children? I have four children. And their, their health condition of the four children, it, it describe each? Um, my son Jacob is plagued by chronic infections. Um, he had abscesses in the back of his throat just this past winter alone. My son David and Jacob who were diagnosed with asthma as I was after handling my husband's soiled clothes. Um, my daughter Ariel has chronic skin infections. She's had pneumonia and strep throat this past winter. My youngest child, Taryn, seems to be the one that's most significantly affected. She's seven years old. She weighs 39 pounds. She has failure to thrive. She has chronic esophagitis and gastritis, as well as chronic abdominal pain. Her immune system does not respond appropriately when she receives vaccinations. She does not mount a response to them. The room where, uh, where I stored his baggage. She was healthy before that? She was perfectly healthy before that. Sorry to I edit. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. My name is Nick Roberts. I served with the Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 24. I was assigned to the air detachment just a few miles south of Port of Al Jabal, Saudi Arabia. On January the 20th, 1991, I was awakened by a loud explosion. Running to the bunker, I heard a second explosion and noticed a large fireball, fireball towards the port. Once in my assigned bunker, I put on my gas mask. We all sat there for approximately 20 minutes, and then the all clear was given. We left the bunker and went outside. I estimate that half of the unit returned to their tents, and the other half remained outside talking. I was one of the men outside talking. 
Within just a few minutes, my arms, neck, face were stinging, my lips felt numb, and I had a strange taste in my mouth, like a copper penny or perhaps a metallic taste better describes it. Some say a mist came over the camp. I do not remember a mist, but more of a fog. Just about the time we all concluded that we had been hit with something, chemical alarms began sounding. Alarms were going off everywhere. Marines camp nearby began to yell, go back to your bunkers, we have all been gassed. Once back in the bunker, we were ordered to mop level four. Radio transmissions were coming in, confirmed gas attack. I repeat, confirm gas attack. All stations go to mop level four. Soon afterwards, decon teams were called out and our chemical officer found two positive readings for lewisite and mustard gas. We stayed at mop level four for about one hour, and then we were given the all clear once again. Afterwards, many of us went to the water tank and washed ourselves down to stop the stinging. My first symptoms were redness of the skin and welts on my chest by afternoon. The cause of my symptoms is chemical exposure, not to mention the overall exposures from fallout due to intensive bombing to chemical and biological plants, radiation fallout from thousands of depleted uranium rounds used by the United States, exposures to vaccines, nerve gas pills, and months of breathing smoke from more than 300 oil well fires. Gulf War veterans are suffering from chemical poisoning. It is just that some veterans were exposed to more chemicals than the others. To top off January the 20th, 91, our commander explained that what we had witnessed were sonic booms. Sonic booms do not sting your skin or make your lips go numb. In addition, on January 21st, 91, our gas mask filters and chemical suits were exchanged for new ones. As the days and weeks followed, my symptoms began to grow in number. Rashes, small blister-like bumps appeared, fever, night sweats, flu-like symptoms, just to mention a few. After about a month, my lymph glands were swollen and my joints hurt. It's like having the flu round the clock with extra symptoms. Once home, we asked for medical help. We were promised medical care and testing. That never came about. After one year, we were turned over to the Department of Veterans Affairs. The Navy simply said that they were not set up to take care of our medical needs. I began going to the VA in Tuskegee, Alabama. I made several trips, and each time tubes of blood were drawn and pictures were taken of my rashes and infected leg. <laughs> I had chest x-rays, and they took hair samples, skin samples, and other samples. After my, doc after my visits, one doctor wanted to have a biopsy done due to the persistent swollen lymph glands. The surgeon denied the doctor's request and told me I was fine. I never got any med medication from the VA, nor was I ever diagnosed by the VA. I sought private medical help at this point. Within six to eight weeks of testing and a biopsy of my lymph gland, I was diagnosed with non-Hopkins lymphoma, a cancer in stage three. I was started on chemotherapy two days later. So far, I've had three ser series of chemotherapy, each lasting six months. The six, six, <coughs> excuse me, symptoms that I have been suffering from now include dizzy spells, loss of balance, ringing ears, fevers, which are now every night, spells where I fall down, fatigue, joint pain, and mainly at night, severe leg cramps. I have been rated at 100% service connected, total and permanently, for lymphoma cancer. The VA has paid for my chemotherapy treatments thus far. However, after my last treatment, I received a phone call from Tuskegee VA that from now on I would have to seek medical treatment from the VA hospitals or pay my own medical bills. A comparison from my made by former Chief Larry Perry of Battalion 24. By the end of 1993, 399 men out of 758 had been put out of the service because they were medically unfit and medically retired. I will forward this to the committee and ask that it be placed on the record. One other point of interest I would like to make is that I, along with many others from Battalion 24, have undergone intensive testing, which is privately funded for the past three years. Hopefully, we will have the results within the next three to four weeks. 
This study will help me and others who claim they were exposed in the Al Jabal area on January the 20th, 91. I would like to thank the committee for allowing me to present my oral and written statement for the record. Thank you. You all take our breath away. Uh, Ms. Nichols. Good morning, Representative Shays and Towns and other community members, staff, and attendees. I am Denise Nichols, a Desert Storm veteran and nurse who was a flight nurse in the U.S. Air Force Reserves. I served active in reserve and am a retired major who was activated for the war and served at Riyadh, KKMC, and Log Base Charlie. I have a master's degree in medical surgical nursing with a specialty in cardiovascular nursing. I have 20 years experience in medical surgical nursing from staff nursing to critical care to being a clinical specialist to teaching nursing. I've diverted from the material I've already provided in my written testimony about uh, my personal situation. It's there for you in the written record. I'm here today to share with you my nursing observations that I made while serving in theater. The question and comment has repeatedly been made by the DOD that there was no acute symptomology indicating neurotoxin exposure. I beg to differ. In my opinion, there was very clear symptoms of organophosphate neurotoxin exposure that occurred and began in theater. In my written testimony, I've described it, a, dis a description in it of chronological order of symptoms that I observed in people around me where I was. The symptoms were there, but you had to know what you were seeing. That was difficult for medical personnel experiencing the same neurotoxin exposure who were not told or provided the flow of intelligence reports that might have triggered us to recognize these subtle but very clear neurological symptoms. It is also clear that we were trained for the lethal dose, not the incapacitating low-level dose. Although it is only logical to look at the neurological symptoms since we were dealing with neurotoxin organophosphate substances. The changes in behavior, mentation, clouded mental functioning, changes in the basic senses of the body, changes in systems of the body that are all controlled by the brain and brain stem. These include muscular skeletal complaints, thought processing and intellectual functioning, cardiac, gastrointestinal, urinary and hormonal control of the body. The other symptoms and diseases we are seeing are clearly a dysfunctional immune system problem that are overlaying and complicating the neurological damage by activation of viruses. Each of the viruses that we know about in medical science can be connected to other diseases. That is why you're getting a complex picture of diseases. This is exactly the combination of acute symptoms that presented in our troops in the guff and afterwards. It is indeed interesting that unexplained, unexplored deaths occurred in such significant numbers to some of the healthy Americans, healthiest Americans during this very short war. It's also interesting to reflect on the categories of troops aeromedically evacuated from the theater. These categories of injuries included muscular skeletal injuries, female veterans experiencing large amounts of menstrual bleeding disorders, and accidental judgment type injuries. With exposures to neurotoxin, the most likely injuries we would, we would and did see were indeed present. An example of the injuries includes the combat veterans playing with unexploded ordnance. They took cluster bombs, picked them up, and brought them into their tent, and there was an accident involving that. That is not clear judgment in a combat situation. We were trained better than that. There was weird occurrences in this very short war. The evidence of acute symptoms was there all alone, along in the DOD's own realm the whole time during and after the war. Yes, it is in our head. 
It is in our brainstem and our brain with viral activation. The crime here is a withholding of vital information that relates to the health of the veteran, portions of the civilian population, and possibly even members of Congress and the administration. Why do I say this? Our pilots have been treated no differently than any of the rest of us. They were given their normal flight physicals every year, but detailed neurological examination that would have shown these problems has not occurred. And my fear is when we're all on airplanes flying around this countryside. It needs to be addressed now. It cannot be put off, not until January. <coughs> and the DOD needs to come forward with the truth. The crime continues with the withholding of medically prudent care. Medicine is the practice of an art. It is not re reasonable to raise it to the level of a legal case. We need to compensate the veterans who laid their lives in harm's way. We are indeed victims, prisoners of a failed system. We have taken significant casualties due to medical mismanagement and hiding from the truth from the very system that we were once proud to serve. The, we were, and I doubt never will be equipped and able to fight effectively in a chemical war. Where do you evacuate troops to in an environment that's huge, toxic environment? I mean, where do you evacuate them to? Where's the clean area to decontaminate patients and equipment? Obviously, we forgot a very basic military tenet used in our training, the KISS principle. It's also re re represent, re it's also unbelievable that this has been allowed to continue for six years. We are now at risk of having casualties that I term the friendly collateral casualties. These are the wives, husband, children, parents, and family that we left safe at home when we went to war. The Civil Reserve Air Fleet personnel and civil service personnel and their families who dealt with our returned equipment and supplies the DOD made some crucial errors in bringing home equipment that was soaked with oil containing neurotoxins. The wives were then exposed by simply washing the veterans' clothing. A clear vector of a deadly toxin was brought home, and the CDC has not been totally informed nor activated to investigate this veteran and public health problem. The blood of our own soldiers is on the hands of the DOD. They study what they want to study, and they waste money leading you in the wrong direction, sir. They have an old cronies network, and it sure seems to be in play now. There are so many culprits in this disaster. They must atone for their errors and ignorance. We need aggressive, assertive leadership to handle this nightmare. We, the veterans, are ready once again to help solve the problems that others have created. We all need to come to the planning table very quickly and strategize quick, effective actions to limit further exposures and injury. We need to heal the fracture that has occurred in the command structure. We have lost confidence and trust. Veterans were mistreated. They were labeled malingerers, and they were disciplined. What emotional trauma on top of physical injury. That needs to be corrected. The veterans will not accept anything but the truth and nothing but the truth. We will not accept psychosomatic diagnoses. We will not accept PTSD. We want the truth. We are bright, we are intelligent, we're some of the best you've ever seen. The veterans and their families who have suffered so much need immediate medical care and financial support to avert a further devastation on this nation's honor. They have been inappropriately treated and emotionally traumatized by the system. We are doing an apology and hasty rectification all we ever asked for was for the contract that we agreed to serve under to be honored. 
If you cannot honor that contract honestly and completely, then no other American troops should ever be sent into harm's way again. We refuse to be used or abused any further. We will not be treated as guinea pigs that it seems has happened in the past with the radiation veterans and the Agent Orange veterans. We stand tall, not only for ourselves, but for the Vietnam veterans that reached out to help us, the newest group of veterans, for the Americans that have supported us, and most of all, for the current and future forces that are at risk now. Please learn the lessons now so our lives would not have been lost in vain. And please never, never let this happen again. Thank you, Ms. Nichols. Um, it's the intention of um, the chair to uh, call on uh, a number of my colleagues uh, in this order. Uh, I'm going to call on Mr. Towns and Mr. Sanders, and then I'll probably come to Ms. Morello on our Republican side of the aisle, and then I'll call on Mr. Green and Mr. Barrett, and I may jump in, uh, and Mr. Fatah will go in, in that order. So, Mr. Towns, you have the floor. Right. Thank you um, very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by saying um, I've been really, really, really touched by the information that has come forward. And I must say in a very loud and clear voice that uh, I'm disappointed that DOD did not come uh, and participate in this hearing because I think that this is a very important hearing. And I think that we need to look for answers. And I think that uh, working together that we can find uh, some answers. Um, uh, let me just sort of move very quickly to you, Mr. Roberts. I want to make certain that I understood you very clearly. You said 399 out of the 758 in your outfit were discharged. And was that for medical reasons, were you saying? Did I understand you correctly? Yes, sir. Yes. That, was, that was for medical reasons. Yeah, med well, we were kind of being threatened there when, the, uh, when we started getting media attention. And the more we, the louder we got, the more of this started to be put out, you know, medically unfit for, you know, we couldn't do our physical uh, training, you know. Uh, like myself, they threatened to put me out because I couldn't do, couldn't do the fi physical fitness test. So I just, I just went ahead and got out. I mean, I was too sick to uh, argue with them at that time. I've seen the study and I've seen how, how it was done. It, w it was uh, compared with uh, muster sheets from the battalion and then the current mustard sheet uh, at 93, end of 93. So out of the, the 7 of 58, 399 were separated for medical reasons? That's, that's what I read. I mean, that's what I understood and took off the report. And like I said, I'll send the report to you and you can go from there. Mr. Chairman, I'd like for that to be a part of the record as well. Uh, Brian, how long were you in service? I was in just under four years, sir. I, um, I became ill and uh, I, I could no longer jump. I was a paratrooper. Uh, I was having a, a hard time with my physical training and like I said in my testimony that every time I would run I would, I would violently vomit and a, a, an ambulance would have to come get me taking me to the hospital. And uh, there was just, the army wouldn't let me advance, they wouldn't let me change units, they just berated me and, and it was just time that I leave. And you had no symptoms of abnormal kind of physical conditions prior to going into the military? No, sir. I, uh, growing up, I, I, seven years of karate, two years of boxing. I was, I was in the sports. I was very healthy, very physically fit. And uh, airborne school was a breeze. Basic training, I won the AUSA award for Soldier of the Cycle. In uh, AIT, I won high PT awards. I was 26 years old when I joined the service, and I could outdo any of the 18-year-olds. And uh, airborne school was no problem. I loved it. I loved jumping out of airplanes. The more physical the Army could be, or, or as we were taught, it's better to, to, to sweat in peacetime than bleed in war. And I trained hard. And when I came home, I could no longer train. And, uh, and so I was worthless to the military. And it was either I get out, try to get out on an honorable, or be kicked out. And uh, so I chose the early out. You have children? Yes, sir, I do. I have two. I have a six-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son. 
Uh, our six-year-old daughter is perfectly healthy. Our four-year-old son almost died at birth. He had a freakish umbilical cord that just had a lot of problems. Uh, to this day, as a matter of fact, Tuesday was his first day of school at four years old because our school district feels with his problems uh, they should bring him to uh, the, the school a couple of years early and uh, assign a teacher to him individually to work with him so he would be prepared to join normal students uh, when it's his time. Thank you. Mr. Kaplan, um, you, you gave us uh, a couple of suggestions, but I would like to just reverse roles for a moment. You know, we'd like to assume that you're a member of Congress. What do you suggest that we should do as members of Congress? I know you gave us three suggestions, and, but the point is that you have any other uh, things you feel that we should do as members of Congress now that we have certain information? Well, yes, sir. As far as uh, some of the uh, questions about the reliability of our chemical detection equipment, I would like to know, uh, as a member of Barry Kaplan, member of Congress from Southington, Connecticut, I would like to know what are the military specifications of the M8 chemical alarm and the Fox chemical detection vehicle. And if the contractors did not meet those specifications because DOD is claiming it was false alarms, I think action should be taken against those contractors in accordance with the federal acquisition regulations. But that would require a GAO investigation, as you well know. That's number one. Um, there, there are several others like that. But, I mean, if we take hard-hitting looks at, at some of these uh, uh, claims by DOD, I, I think that uh, uh, use, utilizing uh, established federal regulations and law uh, we should be able to deal with each one of those hand in hand. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Nichols, uh, you sort of alluded to the fact that you feel there's a cover up. I try to be polite at all times. Sometimes it's difficult. Um, it's very obvious that there was neurological symptoms in theater. Um, we were under the same exposure and maybe that's why it wasn't picked up. And it's taken me this long to finally get a clear enough mind functioning out of a neurologically damaged, foggy brain. Uh, so I don't know if I would, I, I, I hate to use the terminology except for the way I said it in my uh, testimony is that there, there is data out there, very apparently there, I believe they knew about it. I believe they knew full well, and I don't understand why they have done this to us at all. Are you concerned that CDC is not actively involved? Yes, in I am, sir. My uh, child has been, her health has been changed since I came back from the war. All we can do is closely monitor her and for changes, and whatever I find out about the testing that the uh, we need uh, from the medical researchers and doctors that independently have stepped forward at great expense to themselves. As I find that information out, I try to share it with other vets and I try to get my uh, daughter tested, you know, with the same things I'm going through. Um, I feel that it is being passed along through, um, you know, when you look at it medically, you've got to look for vectors, what came back from theater. I think that we also have de developed, and Dr. Bombswiger and Dr. Howard Ernavis could probably explain it much more succinctly than I can, um, but we've had immune system activation, uh, aggressive lymphocytes that may be passed on to those that are genetically similar to us that would be most susceptible through close family contact is continued uh, development. My um, mother and my aunt met me at the, when I came home. My mother's health has changed. She wasn't there that long, but here I came off the plane and hugged. We're close to some degree. She's elderly. Uh, her immune system's not strong at that point point in her life she's had bad immune system. Uh, her health has changed. My aunt who came with her had the strangest death and I cannot discount 
in my own mind with my own training that it wasn't somehow connected. Let me uh, again thank all of you for your testimony and to uh, say to you that uh, I've been touched by it and uh, this member will continue to push and to work uh, to try and get some answers and of course um, regardless to um, uh, what happens with this committee the next time around uh, you can be assured that this is something that long as I'm around the Congress we will continue to push. So I want to thank all of you for your, uh, your, your, your answers and information that you've uh, brought forth. And I gathered from your comments that you're saying there's a lot of other folks out there that have similar problems. And I, I sort of get that feeling from you as you uh, testify. This is just a sample of downloaded messages from veterans, just a sample divided by category ca cardiac neurological problems, various overlapping situations. Just a, a small sampling. Uh, Mr. Jim Tewitt has tremendous amounts of data because of the survey he did through Senator Regal's office. There is a huge amount of suffering. We don't know the total number. When I visit Washington, I go to the wall and I see a wall with 58,000 names on it. And I wonder how big our wall is going to have to be. We have number games going on. There was a hundred uh, mention of 191,000 in the VA newsletter. 80% may be symptomatic. We can't seem ourselves trying to get the information to get straight data. You get straight data, and it looks a different way. So, Ben Johnson would say there's something rotten in the cotton. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Uh, Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, and I want to thank all of the veterans you in there. What I'd like to request, Mr. Todd, if you move your mic to in the middle there, we move it towards you and you can speak to both through both of them. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank and, and express my appreciation to all of the people up here for your persistence and your courage in pursuing the issue. And I think, as, as Ms. Nichols said, we understand that you're not here just for yourself but you're here to make sure that this does not happen again. And I think Ms. Nichols is right in saying that if we can't do better by our veterans, we should not be sending people off in harm's way again. Um, let me start off by asking uh, Mrs. Kaplan and, and Ms. Nichols and anyone else who wants to respond. Mrs. Kaplan, you talked about how your children were exposed to contaminants in your uh, husband's clothing or equipment that he, he brought back. Are you aware, and that your children then became casualties of the war quite as much as, as people who were over there, uh, and Ms. Nichols as well, are you aware of other families where um, uh, similar type uh, problems develop where children or other family members were exposed to toxins in, in clothing or equipment back home? Yes, sir. Um, my husband was with a group of other men, six to eight of them, that he was in intimate contact with and did a lot of work with. And um, six of them are, are sick, very sick. And one of them, uh, Sergeant Alcantara, has a little girl who um, is probably about nine now who has the same symptoms that my daughter has, the same GI problems. And he stored his gear in her playroom. When we lived in Germany, we lived in a very, very small stairwell, if you will, a small apartment with not a big storage area. And with the drawdown of the 3rd Armored Division, our soldiers' clothes came home via mail. They weren't put onto equipment because the equipment came back to the States. And so they had their things sent via the um, airplanes. And I do know that she does have a lot of the same GI problems that my daughter has. Uh, Ms. Nichols, did you want to respond to that? Yes, I do. Uh, I think I mentioned in my testimony, I, I have a lot of data. Uh, I've had trouble keeping up with it all and keep functioning and have any kind of uh, life besides this. It swallowed me up. <laughs> I'm waiting for it to give me back my life. Um, my child um, had perfectly good health when I left for war. She now has what they called a congenital cataract in her eye. It wasn't there before. And I have very good doctors. I guarantee a nurse with 20 years and a master's degree is only going to screen and use the very best. I found another veteran in southern Colorado, his child about the same age as mine, uh, having that symptom. Uh, my concern is for her vision and for her, her health. but. This is widespread. Um, Jim Tewitt can uh, reference the study he did through Senator Regal's Banking Committee report. 
uh, it is out there. I guess we were hesitant to talk about it. I know I uh, talked to Mr. Tewitt many times about the fears that we have to go through in coming forward and how people might overreact in the public. So we were very concerned about that. But other individuals, family members are sick. We've got a sister of a veteran in California. The other thing that's important to remember is our equipment that came back was not decontaminated. We had the people at Sharp Army Depot that never went into theater that handled our equipment. They started getting symptoms. Are you aware of any study done by the DOD or, or the VA uh, about people <laughs> becoming sick as a result of exposure to clothing or equipment? No, sir. Is anybody aware of uh, did, did you want to? Actually, I was tested and not treated at Walter Reed Womack Community Hospital. Walter Reed Medical Center. Excuse me. Um, the, the DOD seems to think that we are ignorant. Um, my husband and I have investigated this for five years. We have doctors here in our home state where we are from that have tested. They have no conclusive answer to what is wrong. All they can say is that this is due and possibly due to the Persian Gulf Syndrome. Now when you take all of the medical records that were uh, tested upon, x-rays, ultrasounds, blood tests, take them to a so sophisticated DOD hospital and the physicians there look at it and ignore it, set it aside, this is not important. This is not happening to you. This is all in your head. I'm sorry. This is not in my head. This is not in the veteran's head. This is not in anybody's head except for the DOD's head. This is gross incompetence knowing that there are children that are being born every single day from Persian Gulf families who are dying of liver dysfunctions, who are very hyper who have temperatures of anywhere from 99 to 105, who have brain tumors, who have uh, brain swelling, to, ha to have uh, massive heart attacks within a matter of 24 hours seeing a, a physician. A 12-month-old baby just does not go in and get an all-clear signal from their physician and within a matter of 24 hours collapses over and dies of a massive heart attack. I'm sorry. These children are a supposed to be a future, something that everyone can look upon when we get old. They're supposed to be able to take care of us. Now, how do you expect them to take care of us when they're being born with these dysfunctions and there's no answers, trying to say that this is just all, I guess you could say, in a room like this, let's just say we all have the same problem. Would you say that that is, is a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, a, yeah, thank you. A coincidence. I'm sorry, it's not a coincidence. I was particularly interested uh, in Mrs. Kaplan's statement. Here you have uh, exposure to uh, what you believe is, is, is toxic uh, toxicity, and the children suddenly become ill. I, that seems to be a pretty clear cause and effect, and I was wondering if others had seen it even that directly. Actually, I I meant I, I will I will not state the name of this child that I met at uh, at uh, Walter Reed. Um, she was 14 months old. At that age, you are to be walking, crawling, somewhat talking. This child started to walk, and within a matter of days of getting down the pattern of walking. Something crippled her to where she couldn't even walk. She had to lay on the ground and pull herself like this. Can't even move her legs, can't even stand up, can't even say mommy or daddy. Something's not right. She has the same rashes that her father had or has. Uh, she has um, uh, sh just like the same attention dis uh, disorder that her, her father has, uh, like our son. Uh, exact same rashes, hyperactivity, uh, a lot of problems. Um, I don't know what caused the high alkaline levels or pH levels in my semen, but my wife has, has testified and, and we've gone on national television talking about the burning semen and the shooting of fire. Um, my wife is so, has been so sick and, and still is that Walter Reed um, 
seen her, uh, the Secretary of the Army last year, Togo West, gave her a year's free medical care because of her conditions are so severe. And all, there was only two or three people that knew that she was not a Persian Gulf veteran. She was diagnosed with somatization disorder also. Let me just, if I can, Mr. Chairman, ask one more brief question, which maybe touch, uh, just touches on what Mr. Martin uh, indicated. In your opinions, uh, how good uh, has the uh, VA treatment been uh, for the concerns that you and others uh, have, have had? Sir, when I testified in March to this committee, I, I said then that I was getting compensated for squeaky wheel syndrome. My, my connection with Senator Regal, Congressman Upton, the national media, I feel the VA has been pressured into treating me right. I could tell you horror stories. I have a cassette tape from my answer machine that I'm going to submit to this committee so you could listen to one day's messages. Of, of families being turned down. There's a lady in this audience today, Diane Dolka, whose husband died of pancreatic cancer. Four times she has been denied her benefits because the VA just will not put a service connection to it. Uh, you know, th we could tell you this all day long. All of us could. All of us talk to veterans all day long. People in this room have talked to veterans. But it's funny how we see a different thing than the VA does or the DOD does. And I, I don't care about their scientific study compared to our humanitarian reasons. The, the truth is there. They just need to listen to us. They don't need to listen to what the DOD sends them by mail. Commissia, they, they've denied that. Has the VA done anything? I've called. I've called. There's a doctor that's going to be on your next panel that diagnosed me with my chemical injuries. I've called her and asked her, okay, now, now that they said that I may have been exposed to sarin, what are you going to do? I was told nothing. There's nothing that can be done. Test, uh, you know, whatever, whatever was in me could have dissipated by now. I'm still sick. Why hasn't that dissipated? So, you know, it, it's, it's just a constant banging your head against the wall with these people. It's a, it's a nightmare. We've had to educate the VA. You know, we're having to come forward with the information. I take information down to the VA hospital in Denver all the time and share information with them and go, okay, guys, come on, here's the information. What do I need to do? Provide educational level training for you, neurotoxin exposures. Um, this is what we need. I bring them in information from the independent researchers. So the care has not been good at all. Uh, I would like to add that this can't go on. This cannot go on, and I put recommendations out when we did congressional briefings and when we've been up here on the Hill so many times over the last several months, and we cannot wait any longer. We're, we're starting to almost take more collateral-friendly uh, casualties. So I would encourage you all that after the election day, you look and find a way to continue this in November after the election. We cannot wait, and we need a Christmas gift. We need to be able to give some hope to our families for Christmas. Minister, I have another question. Thank you. Um, Ms. Merla. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this series of hearings. Um, I want to thank the panelists because you're, you have shown great courage in coming before us and going through horrendous situations probably over and over again. Your moving personal experiences do, uh, do not only encourage, motivate, uh, require that after the election that we do get back to the issue in terms of what is our role as uh, overseeing a government. I, I, uh, I, I may be repeating a few of the things that have been stated, but I see here that we did not hear, our chairman did not hear that DOD was not going to come until he got a fax message at 10.24. No, that that is the explanation which we'll submit for the record. They told us two days ago that they would not be here. That so, they, that they yeah. would not be we, here, and so now the explanation arranged, but even We had arranged, I just for the record, we had arranged our panels to accommodate them, but then they decided to withdraw. And then the President's Advisory Commission also could not make it because they didn't feel equipped, I guess, to, to respond to the, uh, to the situation. I also have um, um, read or heard that they, they say they have, an, I think in this letter too, an ongoing investigation uh, the DOD is performing on possible uh, chemical exposures, um, and they're going to be completing that program, I guess, of that investigation soon. And this picks up on a question I, I heard, I think it was Mr. Sanders who asked, have you been um, part of this investigation? 
Do you know a lot of people who have been? Do you think there's a cross-section? What is your reaction to this so-called DOD investigation? Ma'am, when, when Dr. Stephen Joseph claimed that they were doing a thorough investigation of members of the 37th Engineer Battalion that was at Kamasia, I personally called Stephen Joseph's office and told them, I'm Brian Martin, I made the videotape of Kamasia, I was there, I'm sick, what does he want to know? I was told to call the Persian Gulf hotline. I said, no, I'm not calling a hotline. I want to talk to Stephen Joseph or somebody that wants to ask me questions. Let's hear it. Then I was told to write down my concerns on paper and mail it to them. And I said, this is your investigation? I said, this is nuts. And, and uh, I was told, well, if, you know, accept it or, or just forget it. Uh, the only time that I, I feel that anybody investigated me was after I testified to this committee in March, a Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Martin approached me outside of the restroom door. Uh, uh, demanding. demanding. I mean, he'd come off like my friend. You know, my, my brother's name is Brian Martin, and la la la, and civilian clothes. And, and uh, when I asked him if he was a Persian Gulf veteran, he said, well, no, actually, my name is Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Martin. I'm with the Persian Gulf Illness Investigation Team. They want your tape. They want my videotape. By the time I got home, there was four more messages on my answer machine. For three and a half months, I held these people off on that videotape until I finally made them file a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Request Act, to me for it, because I was sick of their games. And this is what they call an investigation. Here I am, I've given myself to them. I said, I'll answer anything you want. I was the commander's driver. I know everything that happened there. But so far, no good, no questions. I appreciate that response. I just wondered if, uh, you know, the Kaplans or Mr. Roberts or Ms. Nichols would like to briefly comment on what you know about this thorough investigation. Uh, Ms. Morella, uh, I want to comment one thing. I was here at the Presidential Advisory Committee that met here on 4th and 5th, and it was real interesting to note that the DOD and the CIA were taking credit for exposing the Kamasia bunker incident when we all know that's because of Brian Martin and his tape. And yet they take credit for it and pack themselves on the back at a presidential advisory committee. Now my question to you is if they change the truth that way and all the other changes of truth, why do we quit wasting time with them and move forward without them? because they're obviously not dealing with the ground truth of what happened. And we could go around for years waiting for them to, to break down. And that's inappropriate. The, the research studies have been done. It's interesting that none of us, and I'm sure we're all out there in the public, uh, none of us, I haven't gotten one of the questionnaires from the VA on their 15,000 and matched response. We sure weren't in that group. Uh, all people. I mean, you know this. I mean, we're out there in the public, and exactly. we're not in, involved as one of their little sample cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, is that your experience, also, like Mrs. Kaplan? Um, yes, we um, spoke with Dr. Josephs when we were part of the CCEP program at the uh, request of Dr. Chung, and at that time we talked about the soldiers in my husband's unit, 9th of the 227th, who were ill. And they assured us at that time that they would do an epidemiologic study of the unit because there was such overwhelming evidence that something was going on. There was, as far as I know, never any follow through. We never received any information on that. And the people that we know of who are ill have never been contacted. Um, as far as the, the PGW investigation out of Dr. Joseph's office, when I heard about it, I called them. I went up speaking with two different people there. One man, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, was basically, oh, geez, this is just a terrible situation. What can we do? And I'm thinking, this is not a proper response. And the other person I talked to, I wanted to know. I wanted to know what areas they were going to look at as far as chemical areas, possible chemical exposures and locations, so that I could see if any of my husband's um, positions, which he documented through the war, were in any of the areas they were going to look at. And he told me basically that was, you know, basically secret and he couldn't tell me anything. But the bottom line response was that they were going to handle the investigation by reviewing all of the old reports. Now, all of the old reports have not told us anything. So I'm not sure that this is going to be a fruitful study. Ms. Morella, on, on that question again, um, I have a real concern with the numbers they're reporting. And I've heard this from congressional staff members when I've gone around to meet with them and try to push people along. You know, we need help out here. Um, and I was asked by one of the staff members who happens to be a Gulf War vet, why do you think they're doing this? 
I gave some answer at the time. It hit me when I got home. Maybe it's so big. Maybe the numbers are so huge that they don't know what to do. It just sounds that, uh, as though uh, by omission and, and not following through that they begin a study where they've lost already lost some credibility. And, I, and, I, and that's rather frightening. I have Barry Kaplan's diagnosis recap here, and I noticed that CCEP asked only one question, and that had to do with, uh, uh, what do they call it, somatization disorder? Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, would the rest of you like to comment? I noticed that the Army, retirement, VA, others, uh, other, other areas have been checked off. Is this a kind of a stark omission, would you say? in terms of... Um, well, uh, okay. the other panel members don't have the privilege of, uh, or uh, dis <laughs> privilege of having my little uh, quickie chart, ma'am. Uh, but you're absolutely right. From 91 to 94, I was diagnosed uh, with those items by the Army at uh, Walter Reed and also at Navy G Balboa Hospital. I show up for the CCEP in August of 94, August of 94. Uh, everything else previously was disregarded as clinically insignificant. Now, clinically insignificant means that I'm split from stem to stern. I've had a thing called the Nissan Funplication, right, where you rebuild your esophageal sphincter. In other words, the little gate well, valve. You become medical experts. Well, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. In other words, I'll put it the way that my daughter says it. Daddy's got a big boo-boo and a zipper. All right, that's why I have from here to here. But that was clinically insignificant. Mm -hmm. Thus, the information chain pushed for the somatization disorder up through the chain of command, and that's what is being reported by Dr. Josephs. When Dr. Josephs says somatization disorder, psychological, right, he's talking about a very, very narrow focused diagnosis on Barry Kaplan. I also have to respond because as part of the CCEP program, I also went there. The first thing that I was told by the head of the program was that I was probably just under stress. I went for my exams, um, urine, blood, chest x-ray, and went to see the physician and he said, oh geez, you know, you have some abnormals here. Well, the abnormals include esophagitis, gastritis, the abnormals include a polygamopathy, which means that my body is basically fighting something, but they don't know what it is. I have an abnormal bone marrow, which my oncologist recently said could be some type of chronic infection, but they can't identify it. And I came away from the CCEP with a somatoform disorder diagnosis. Now, these are not things that you can dream up. I mean, these are lab results. I, I want to just, if the gentleman lady would allow me just to uh, test for her yield. I just want to, for the record, uh, establish this document. This is a document that you're providing us that shows basically 14 ailments that were uh, confirmed by more than one test, but then when you went before the CCEP, the only ailment they had down was salmonization. That is absolutely correct, sir. So now it, I have provided, yeah. excuse me, I have provided the Army retirement physical along with my two VA comp and pension exams, copies that I've provided to your staff, I believe they're in the packet, verbatim, off of those three documents. That, those documents will back up this, but yes, I sir. just thank you. Thank, thank you for yielding. I know that I've, I've taken up, uh, really stretched my time. I had, had just wondered maybe in conjunction with uh, an answer to someone else about whether any doctor at VA or DOD had asked you whether you had any new intolerances, sensitivities, allergies to substances since the Gulf War. Maybe I get a yes or no answer. Nope. 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 I do, ma'am, and I can address it on the uh, intolerances. We've had Desert Storm veteran meetings, and we've had people get sick. Uh, one of them was at Dallas. Uh, we had uh, six people that had to go to the hospital. We researched, found out that they had, we were in a holodome, and we had the meeting rooms way at the other end. They uh, put the um, chlorine or the chemical treatment in the pool, and they turned on the bubblers. And as the vapors came down, people started getting sick. They broke out in their rashes. They started flushing in their face. They respond pretty well when you put them on oxygen and IV. Um, but when they went down, and Mr. Jim Tewitt, Betty Zuspan, and I were at the hospital one night at 2 o'clock in the morning in Dallas, 
waiting for some of the troops to recover uh, on oxygen and IV. I said, we got into a discussion that we ought to videotape one of these times that a vet goes down, compare it with, with the uh, tapes and studies the military has done, and some of us saw training films with neurotoxins and rats and whatever, and they, they spasm them and all because it's very, very similar, I mean, it's the same thing, and, and have a videotape on TV to say, who do you believe, the veteran or your government? I thank the panel and, and defer back to the chairman. Mr. Martin, you looked like you had a final shot. Um, what I was going to tell you, ma'am, and anybody in this committee is more than welcome to, to, to do this. My wife, over the past three years, has developed seven spots in her skull where the bone matter is disappearing, like an overripened melon, it caves in and has flat spots. She has numerous lumps in her breast that we have told the VA about over and over again. She has had gynecological problems where when she was at Walter Reed, they discovered that one of her ovaries had detached and reattached under her belly button. They had to detach it again and redo it. And in the process, they gave us a videotape of nine minutes of an hour and 45 long minute uh, uh, procedure. And it showed them popping a cyst. Well, then we were told that it was a cyst that they lanced. We were told that they, they popped the, lan uh, the cyst. And then the next day, we were told that she was in three years early pregnancy. When she went to see the psychiatrist, the paid Sigmund Freud at Walter Reed, Colonel Follinsby. You meant three months early pregnancy. No. Three years. Three years early pregnancy. This is what is in her paperwork. I don't know. I was what, what, was it, what does that mean? I was told that I was in a, stuck in a gestation period of a three-year pregnancy. That was the exact words. Uh, it gets better. After she's seen Col Colonel <laughs> Follinsby, and, and we presented, because Ross Perot paid a lot of money for my wife to have x-rays and, and, and various medical uh, testing. testing. When we presented this to Colonel Follinsby, he told her that she was sexu sexually molested at the age of three by her father, and that she was stressed. She, he wrote in her paperwork that my wife is concerned over an onslaught of media attention. She sees people on TV, and we laughed about it because we are the people on TV. We're, my wife and I are the ones that do most of the national television shows on Gulf War Syndrome. And when we explained it to him, he basically just said, she needs help. Get her out of here. Um. Ms. Morelli? No, I, no I, I've finished. I, I thank, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Patel, thank, thank you for your patience. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is. Let me thank the, uh, the, the panelists, uh, both for their presentations and for their uh, service uh, to the uh, country. This is a very timely issue, obviously, because the country has now dispatched other soldiers to the Gulf. Um, and to have this matter continue to, um, you know, be uh, in front of us without any clear answers uh, raises uh, a whole host of questions, not just as it relates to your uh, unfortunate circumstances uh, related to illnesses, but more importantly and moreover with the Department of Defense's uh, lack of uh, uh, follow-through. I mean, I think that I was almost convinced at the last hearing that they were doing everything that they could do. Uh, their lack of uh, presence today, I think, uh, convinces me uh, to the contrary. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Martin, you were as a part of uh, uh, this effort to, um, to destroy these, uh, these um, uh, storage facilities, for lack of a better word, um, uh, did your chemical detector ever uh, activate? There was 150 of us, sir, up there at Camasilla, and after we set the time charges and moved back three miles, we spread out along a road about a mile and a half by company. I was the commander's driver, headquarters company was here. Chemical detector go off. I never heard any. Now, members of Alpha Company of the 37th claim that they did. Engineering battalion? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Bravo Company, Charlie Company, and headquarters never heard any chemical alarms. F a few members of Alpha Company of the 37th Engineering Battalion said that they heard chemical alarms, went in the mop gear for maybe 20 minutes or so. The, none, the rest of us did not. Nobody warned us. Nobody got on the radio. In the videotape, which I submitted to the committee, you will see that we're walking around in short sleeve shirts, no mask. Uh, I have pictures here where my flak vest is sitting on my Humvee. Try to get to this now. When you when you were when you received orders to to go to this location and to destroy these uh, can we call them storage facilities or bunkers, ammunition bunkers. Were, they, were they inspected prior to uh, their destruction? 
We went through about a dozen. Part of the orders to take a look inside? Yes, it was. It was part of the orders. We had to chase the civilians out of the area that was trying to steal ammunition to fight Saddam's Republican Guard. Once we did that, then we went into what bunkers we could. There was only about 13 to 15 bunkers that we could actually go into because all the doors were live mine. Out of these bunkers, what did you see? I guess is my well, question. We saw 95% American ammunition in there. Okay. So You'll see this in the videotape. Mm-hmm. So the question is, if, were there, did you see any, any uh, evidence of chemical? None of us were chemical experts, sir. We were, uh, we were told there was, there was two guys in a truck that came in from uh, uh, EOD, um, uh, Explosive Ordnance Disposal Team. They looked around, they got out of the truck, kind of looked around and said, blow it. That was it. Uh, now, I have heard stories, but without documentation, I'm not going to say a word about that. Everybody has a story. But what I saw with my own eyeballs no member of the, ma of the 37th Engineer Battalion is what you would call a chemical expert. There was, there was uh, uh, combat engineers put into chemical NCO spots because we didn't have chemical experts, so they would quickly train somebody and say, okay, you're the chemical NCO. Let me just say in, in conclusion, um, because I know there's a vote that we have to, to leave to go to, but um, I think the, the frustration of the members and the chairman of the committee is that, you know, we got reports from the CIA that says, you know, there was no chemical exposure. We got the Pentagon saying for forever now uh, that, you know, and then they admit that there was some limited exposure. Now they've expanded the possibility that there may have been um, uh, many more of our uh, veterans exposed potentially. Um, it keeps kind of creeping out. Now, you came home from the Gulf when? I came home from the Gulf March 8, 1991, because my best friend, who was 24 years old, died of a heart attack during the ceasefire. Me and nine other people were sent home for his funeral. Now, and so and you've been you've been involved in this from day one. So yes. President Bush and um, uh, General Powell, up through Clinton and Perry. Yes, Your sense of whether we are making any progress on this issue is what? I think as individual individual legislators, yes. My Congressman Fred Upton come in here today shows how much he supports what I do and, and, and what we all do. Uh, Congressman Shays, uh, the, the, the aggressiveness he had on 60 Minutes when Joseph, uh, Dr. Stephen Joseph refused to answer the question, he said, you will answer it. That is what we need. But we need that banded together as a whole committee. And all, all I can answer about how I feel about the CIA, the President, and everybody else, one thing, who are you going to believe? We were there. We know what we saw. We, we know what we felt. We know how sick we are now. I don't care what they say. I, kn I was there. I'm a witness. I, I am sick. I've been sick. Uh, th let me thank you for your, your comments. Let me thank the chairman. Now, yield back. Thank, thank the gentleman. We may, I'm not sure if we have a motion to, to, um, to um, I guess this is a motion to override, so it may just be one vote. As soon as our vote is over, we are going to come back. I have not had an opportunity to question any of the witnesses, and I do want to. Uh, and I'm very sorry to have to keep you, have to wait for the boat. But if you don't mind, it may take us 20 minutes uh, or something. Thank you. This committee is at recess. to order. Mr. Green has not yet, that yet asked questions, and so we will go to him. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I apologize to our witnesses because the schedule here between other meetings and votes on the floor, and I know it's frustrating to witnesses, and, and, but I want you to know it shows no lack of concern or, or intensity or support for, for your issue. And I know a lot of questions have been asked. Mr. Roberts, one of the 
questions I had when I was when you were testifying was that the uh, the explosion that was reported to you being a sonic boom. Yes. And uh, do you have any information at all? Because I didn't see it in your testimony on on the was it a scud that was blown up or was it uh, has well, anyone from the DOD given you any information or do you have any of that to share mm, with us? No, so they haven't given me anything. Well, when I testified in '93 up here in Washington, I, I did say I thought it was scuds. But checking with the information I have now, and those scuds came into Saudi Arabia or, or I should say, into Al Jabal area that night. But there were several aircraft that were shot down that night. And my honest opinion is I do believe that an aircraft came in and dropped their rounds and was shot down. An Iraqi aircraft? Yes, sir. That's, that's my opinion based on what I have and putting together pieces. First of all, there was no warning. That's, that's one big factor there. There was no warning of none whatsoever. And when scuds came in, I mean, you had, from the time they were launched, your sirens went off. You had plenty of time, plenty of warning. Uh, and could you tell us again the number in your unit that received some type of medical discharge or uh, from the service? There's 399 out of 700 and I think it was 58. I, I haven't got so it in front of me. more than half of your unit yes, sir. And that you were serving with on that evening received some type of medical discharge? Yes, well, just plainly put out medically unfit, unfit okay. for duty. Uh, some got medical discharge, very few, I think two. And the rest of them were medically retired or retired. Yeah. So what's, what's really interesting, though, by the end of 93, of course, you know, we've pushed a lot since 91 and have gotten a lot of media attention from this. Mm -hmm. By the time we finally pushed Congress to come in and do an investigation on our battalion, well, the Navy, like I said, pretty much, by the time the investigation team got there, they pulled in another 300, 400 new people, and when they did the investigation, they, they kind of pushed the 399 out of the way. Didn't look at that. And even my situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't even encountered. Yeah. So when they did the study and reported back to the Congress, uh, there were no medical problems other than, you know, we all need psychiatric help and this and that and the other. Well, and you understand, our committee... I have some good friends that serve on national security or, or veterans affairs and things like that, and, and our committee typically doesn't. I would be interested, Mr. Chairman, if we had the numbers compared to the other units concerning a medical discharge or, or the, uh, if the percentages were any near uh, what, what yours were. And again, I think we can find that out, um, you know, just using some comparative studies on, uh, on other units that were serving you know, not in your area, but close to you. Mr. Gentleman, we deal with you. Yes. Uh, could ask the question of um, the next panelist. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for each of you for being here. Thank the gentleman. Your testimony uh, can stand on its own. It is uh, very powerful, and it is um, touching at times. It is infuriating. Uh, it, um, it makes you ask a lot of questions like, how could this happen to you? How am I responsible? How are other people responsible? I voted to send you to the Persian Gulf. And I did it because I was absolutely convinced, and still am, that there was a real national interest in not letting Saddam Hussein control directly 20% of the world's oil and indirectly another 30 to 40%. Um, and I always vowed, since I was a Peace Corps volunteer, when my peers were in Vietnam, that if I were ever in public life and had to vote on a decision like sending someone to war, I would be certain, one, that there was a national interest, and secondly, that you would have all the firepower available to win, uh, and win as quickly as possible with as few uh, injuries as possible. So you can imagine uh, uh, the feelings I had. I ended up uh, seeing one of my uh, colleagues who took my place as a state legislator, Chris Burnham, sent there. I had his parents call me up pleading that I not vote, pleading is a strong statement, urging me caution that I not vote to send him to the Persian Gulf. And I had Chris Burnham say, that's where we need to go. 
you can imagine the re rejoice of the entire nation that that so few uh, of our military were injured or killed, and yet we grieved for each of those who were. But we had looked at numbers that could be in the thousands and thousands. And so um, as I began to hear you all during the course of the last few years, it became evident to me that um, my rejoicing was a little too soon. Now, um, I want to ask you, Mr. Martin, I am simply not clear when you uh, left service, um, when you left the service, uh, I am not clear as to what you mean when you say, I put in for early out from the military that I had loved so much, and then you said, I did not receive an exit exam, nor did I know that I was supposed to. I was told not to have children or give blood for one year. I put a big why. First off, I want to understand, were you given a physical when you left? No, sir. When I was out processing, after I put in my paperwork for, uh, to get out of the military earlier than what my actual uh, get out date was, um, I went, I was told to go to a one-stop out processing on Fort Bragg. You go there and they do everything in one building. There's no running around all over post. Uh, when it came time to see a doctor, he, a doctor looked in my eyes, he took my temperature and my blood pressure and told me to be on my way. That was it. Um, after I had gotten out of the service, uh, let's see, it was about two years, I think it was, that I had been trying to prove that I was even in the service because there was no 201 file on me anywhere. Uh, Congressman Upton, he threatened the military as far as um, he called St. Louis and said, you Just know, for the Brian, record, the 201 file is? The 201 file is your personal uh, file in your military right. service. For the record. There, the Department of Defense had claimed that I was never in the service uh, at all. I, there was no records of me anywhere. Congressman Upton threatened St. Louis and told them that, uh, that he didn't care if they were flooded at the time or not to find somebody with scuba gear. Five days later, my records showed up, certified copies in my mailbox, in his mailbox, and uh, uh, I believe certified copies started filtering into Dr. Uh, Murphy's uh, office at the Persian Gulf Referral Center when she was director there. And uh, in it, there was a piece of paper, and I, and I could not find it to bring it to submit to you today because I, I, I will get it to you as soon as I find it. It was a waiver for my ETS exam signed one year before my actual original date that I was supposed to get out of the service, not for my early out date. And it was signed by me and by a doctor, but I, it was not my signature. I've never seen this handwriting before in my life, but it had my name on it. And, uh, and like I said, it was dated one year exactly to the day that I was originally supposed to get out of the service, not the 11 months before when I gave my early out. So your testimony is that the date of the physical or, or the waiver was when you were supposed to get out and that the signature on that document of waiver was not yours? Um, well, part of that's right, sir. Um, the, the date that was on the waiver was one year. I mean, I, uh, it was a year. Like one year after the date on the document, I was actually supposed to get out of the okay, service. Okay. But I put in for an early out 11 months before my original date. Right. And so it, the date it, of the document did, did not jive with the date that you actually... It didn't jive at all, and plus the signature didn't jive. I have a very weird kind of signature. But your testimony is that that is not your signature. That's, that's correct, sir. It's not my signature. Um, I've made it absolutely clear it's did not Did you ask um, uh, whoever had made the statement that you were told not to have children give blood for one year, the, the reason why that statement was made? That was pretty much standard operating procedures at Fort Bragg. They, uh, they had made it clear, you know, they said whenever you go to a foreign country, there could be problems, right. don't have babies or, or give blood. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I think they should have said five years or, or ten or, or whatever because of the children that are born now. Okay. In your uh, statement on Kamasaya, I can say Kamasaya, you all say something Kamasaya. else. Kamasaya. Kamasaya. You, you know what I mean when I say Kamasaya. Yes, um, the, um, the cassette that you took showed the plumes going in the air. Mm -hmm. Now, you didn't take uh, 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 pictures of the actual shells that 60 Minutes had shown, which was a chemical on top of a shell that would project the, the chemical shell out. Excuse me, the shell was on top of a, uh, the warhead, the chemical was on a shell that would have been used to protect no, sir, the chemical. No, sir, I did not take those. Those were other members of the 37th. But I have a photograph right here. This is the front of my Humvee. 
There's a rocket right there that has the yellow chemical marking band on it. I just found this uh, about two or three weeks ago in my photo album. And uh, I, I'd love to submit it for record, but it's my own copy, and I don't know where the negatives are until I find it. I mean, you can have it, but in, no, if I can the, find the negatives. The video, well, that picture is very important. Mm -hmm. I, you can have it. I uh, will I just, find negatives somewhere. No, the picture is very important, and mm -hmm. it needs to be given to the, mm -hmm. the appropriate authorities. We can give it to them, and we need to make sure that there are copies made. I, I, can, I, I can want get to clarify copies of the one point. Too. You were not reluctant to give the video to the to DOD. My understanding is that you wanted them to meet with you so you could discuss with them the video and your challenges. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, in 1994, I gave the tape to uh, the NIH. Um, in 1993, I gave the original copy that I had to Dr. Murphy, which she took home to watch. And, and you know, I can't say anything about that because she's not a chemical expert either. Um, I've given that. I've given over 200 copies of so that. So who has the original? Away. The original is held by um, uh, Major Michael Huber, who's in Fort Leavenworth okay. uh, right now. He had left uh, his instruction uh, position at West Point and is in transition, and therefore I can't find him. And Colonel Konensberg claims he can't find him either. But your, your testimony is that Dr. Joseph was not particularly, excuse me, you never spoke with him, that his staff was not particularly eager to have you speak with, with Dr. Joseph. The only thing that I was told, uh, they called me on a Saturday and, and chewed me out. They said, because of you, we have to work Saturday and Sundays now. And that was it. I said, well, what do you want to know from me? And the, and the lady again said, uh, or I think her name was Rita, she said, um, well, can you write down your, your comments, your statements, and your observations from Kamasia and mail it to us? And I told her no. I was tired of the game playing. I said, as a matter of fact, if anybody else from the Department of Defense calls me, make sure it is Dr. Stephen Joseph or I refuse to talk to anybody. And I haven't had another phone call since. Is this Kamasia? Yes, sir. Okay. And how far away were you at the time? Uh, well, that's inside of Kamasia. That's the front of my Humvee. Okay, so these, these uh, mounds are the, the, the one, a few of the hundred bunkers? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And your testimony is that when you went there, uh, you could get into some of the bunkers, a few, and, and some of them were locked up. Were they locked up because American troops had locked them or because... They were not locked up, sir. There was live mines in the doorway. Okay. That's why I know that all the chemical, or I mean all the bunkers were not uh, um, searched and examined for chemicals because if a chemical team would have been there, which there wasn't, but had they shown up there to look through the bunkers, we would have been the one to clear the doorways for them. Okay, let me clarify this, though. This, so this is not a cooked off, uh, this, was not uh, 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 this was not a projectile. This did not come three miles. No, sir. Okay. It's sitting right there. It's at literally Kamasia. sitting right there. That is one of the, that, the road that I'm sitting on right now is the main road going into Kamasia. Okay. So that was before detonation. Exactly. Okay. I have, I have also other pictures here, sir, if you'd like to see them. It's, uh, this is what the bunkers looked like before. This was, this was the starting of the explosion, during the explosion, and this is what the exact same bunker looked like after the explosion. Okay. Now, and what the ground looked like, it was black and charred. See, what, what surprised us first when, when the announcement was made about Kamasai and, and in terms of its, uh, the fact that chemicals were there and DOD disclosed that, not this latest disclosure about the 5,000. What we, what we were led to believe was, and what we were led to picture, uh, was that you had chemicals in the depot. You did not, at uh, depots, in these bunkers. Mm -hmm. But I did not visualize that they were actually on shells. And so when I saw the plumes, I just visualized, well, there are the plumes, which way are they going? And I just want to make this point to you. Um, but to actually see the pictures and to realize they were on shells that then sent them two, three, four, or five, six miles away, in some cases you point out even 12 miles away, was a, a new revelation to me that I did not know until I watched that program. And part of the challenge is we are constantly learning new things, not through um, eager disclosure. And uh, the other challenge that we learned was when, when um, uh, the head of the CIA was asked about were there chemical weapons used. Aside from not answering the question, he said there were no offensive use of chemicals. And the incredible choice of words makes this committee feel that we are constantly in a game to understand what the truth is and then understand what they're saying and understand whether we're being misled. For instance, in our last hearing, 
we had been wrestling with the fact that DOD has not given the names to the VA of those people who were in the Persian Gulf, and then to be able to have the VA know who was where in the Persian Gulf so that when someone like you comes forward from a particular area in the war, that then they can contact others. We were told 600 names had been given to the VA. There were 600 troops in, in the Persian Gulf. We then, I then made an assumption, 600 people there, 600 names. Uh, 600,000 names, excuse me, 600,000 troops there, 600,000 names given to the VA. Then we learned it was just people active in the military, and some of those 600,000 were not there. So then when we tried to pin down the VA as to how many do they actually have, the names of the people who served there, we still don't know. So I, uh, I, I talked with some people from the VA about uh, putting together a roster of members from the 37th if there was a way that specialized testing or, or epidemiological studies could be done on just our unit. Uh, it's a no-brainer. Uh, it won't be done. No, it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. Everyone who's there, uh, the, the Army should be able to tell, the VA should know, and every one of them should be tested. Case closed. Let me ask you, I'm sorry. I got a call two or three days ago from a medic from the 37th Engineer Battalion that uh, took care of me when I first got sick. He is now stationed in Korea. He called me. He left our unit in uh, April of this year and has been transferred to uh, Korea. He called me to ask me what all this was about because he, d he didn't know anything about it until he just, uh, he, saw, he saw me on CNBC Live uh, a few days ago, uh, or about a week ago, and uh, he wanted to know what this was about. Nobody had tried to contact him. He called his wife stateside. Nobody had contacted her. Finally, they contacted his mother, or he contacted his mother, and he said she told him that someone from the military was trying to find him. And it blew my mind because if he's still active duty, the military should know where he's at. Not calling his mother, they should know he's stationed in Korea. <laughs> Did you see any Russian ammunition? Yes, sir. We used it. We used it. We blew up quite a bit of uh, Russian uh, 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 AK-47s and, and a lot of their uh, ammunition, but I'm we used Russian c some of the Some of the ammunition actually ends up with Leiden in it to, to give it, uh, Lindane, I'm sorry, to give it a, um, uh, uh, the smoke and the plume to know where the shells are actually landing, uh, among other reasons. Let me um, get on to uh, just ask one or two more questions of this panel. Then I'd be happy to go back to either gentleman if they have a question here. Uh, I would like to um, be clear, um, Mr. Kaplan, about the the visual uh, picture, the picture that you described. Also during this period, I saw my first animal remains that were devoid of any insects. I instructed my personnel to stay clear of these carcasses until we were able to burn them. Uh, you're trying to, sh uh, to to illustrate what that even even the insects didn't want to be near these uh, these dead animals. I mean, what is what is? I want you to elaborate on that statement. The uh, the desert where we were located at uh, the Third Armored Division's area of operations or tactical assembly area, known as TAA Victory, uh, was a very desolate place. Uh, uh, there was no, uh, there was either none or very little vegetation in the area. Uh, thus, there was very little or very few food sources for any scavengers. Uh, when you saw camels and, and, and other uh, animals that were devoid of uh, uh, any insects or enemy remains that were void of any insects, flies, desert flies, you immediately became very suspicious of what was going on considering that our areas were full of flies, i.e. our mess halls, our class A ration points. So we instructed our folks to stay away from them until those uh, uh, remains were uh, buried and or burned. So some people handled the remains and burned them? Uh, yes, sir. We had a grave uh, registration <coughs> team that was uh, assigned to my responsibility as a support operations officer. In other words, a logistics officer for our battalion. And uh, they were uh, charged with uh, handling uh, uh, enemy remains. Bottom line to that was it was a picture that you remember at the time because it seemed very unusual to you. Multiple times, yes, sir. Multiple times. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, now ask you, uh, Mr. Roberts, uh, one or two questions that you don't have to answer if you don't want. I just, um, uh, I'm unclear as to your present physical condition. 
Say that again. There. I'm unclear as to your present physical condition. What is the diagnosis that you are wrestling with now? I wasn't supposed to make it through the first of the year, to be honest with you. Because? Uh, well, what, you that, what is your diagnosis? Uh, lymph lymphoma cancer. I see. And are you receiving 100% care from the VA? No. You, you're talking about disability or I just want to know if, if all your health care needs are being taken care of. And if so, by whom? Medical care is taken care of privately. The VA has done nothing what for me. What insurance do you have right now? Uh, I have a very small cancer policy. Okay. And it that's pay, but just minor stuff. Okay. So you're diagnosed with a, a, a very serious form of cancer. Yes, sir. And um, you have insurance, public or private insurance? Is your insurance, do you have insurance from the government or do you have insurance? No, no sir. Not you, good. you have no insurance from the government. Is that right? Well, wait just a minute. I'm getting a little bit confused. I, I'm on I, Social I'm, Security, so, so I guess, okay, I, guess so I can getting, count that. Yeah. Okay, but in terms of the VA now, what type of care is the VA providing you? None whatsoever. None whatsoever? No, sir. You are getting no care from the VA whatsoever? No, sir, and I really don't think I want any from them. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, when you describe the loud uh, noise and um, you describe, you said, within a few minutes, uh, my arms, neck, and face were stinging, my lips felt numb, and I had a strange taste in my mouth, like copper penny, or perhaps a metallic taste better describes it. This is, uh, how, how much uh, after that you heard that sound? Mm, I would say we stayed in the bunker for about 20 minutes. I'd say about 25 to 30 minutes after that. And did you have, put protective gear on, or this before you put protective, did you first well, put protective gear on? By the time I got in the bunker the first time, after I got in the bunker, I put a gas mask on. That was it. You put a gas time. mask on. Did you have this taste before you put the gas mask on or after you put the gas mask on? I think you're a little bit confused. We went in the bunker twice. Okay. Uh, let me just okay. say, this is very important, and you're under oath, and I'm, I'm trying to just make sure that we're very clear because we also have a concern about the knowledge of the troops in terms of how to use the chemical gear. We also have a serious question as to how... Um, capable uh, the chemical gear was, whether it actually did the job uh, that it was supposed to do, and whether the troops knew how to apply it in a way that would uh, make it safe. Mm -hmm. So I just, I, I, this is an important little dialogue that we're having here. Okay. I'd like you to just run through the sound and the noise and what you did. First sound woke me up. Grab gas mask and chemical suit, run outside. Running to the bunker, I saw a big flash. Okay, so you heard a sound, and the, and you ran out with the mask, gas mask on, and the and the. No, not on. You're exactly. just carrying it. Okay. Yes, sir. I mean, and then you see another flash. I saw the flash, then the concu I mean, the sound of the concussion. Okay. Running to the bunker, going to the bunker. Take the uh, gas mask out of its pack, put it on, don you know, don it and everything and sit there for, for a, a good 20 minutes. Describe from when you woke up to how long it took you to get into the, to uh, put your protective gear on. How long? I didn't put my protective gear on the first time. Okay. When I got in the bunker, just the mask. Gotcha. I mean, we were all sitting there wondering what happened, blah, blah, right. blah, at that time. Uh, sat there for about 20, 30 minutes. We got the all cleared over the uh, net radio. So that's when a lot of us went outside and just kind of milling around. And that's when we were exposed at that point. So from the time of the explosion to that point, I have to estimate 25 to 30 minutes. Okay. And I'm just unclear, and it's my problem, not yours, so I just want to be clear. I don't understand when you started to have the taste in your mouth and, right. and when, uh, when you're, uh, within a few minutes my arms, neck, and face were stinging, my lips felt numb, and I had a strange taste. When did, that, when did that start to happen? Maybe I'm explaining it wrong, to be honest with you. No, uh, you're doing a good job. When I came back out, yeah. we got the all clear. Yeah. About half of us were outside standing around. Some yeah. of them were using the restrooms. Okay. Half of them went back to the tent. I was one of the smart people that stayed out there talking. <laughs> well, within two to three minutes after I... Two to three, four minutes. I mean, I'm just estimating I as best of, best of I can. 
and I started feeling up my face like this, and it was feeling funny. I heard one of the, one of the people a couple tents down. He, my face feels like it's on fire. I can tell you his name and everything. Uh, you heard Marine. Something's wrong. Something's burning my skin, and it it, it wasn't. I don't know how to explain the stinging sensation or the burning sensation. Uh, you just started doing like this yeah. and, and rubbing, and, and about the time you figured out, boy, somebody has screwed up royally, that's when the alarm started going off. So then an alarm went off. After all kind of alarms. Went all off. kind of alarms. Yes, sir. So I mean, you you had been woken up. You had run into the bunker. You had put the mask on. You hadn't put your protective gear <laughs> on. You came outside. You were mulling around. You thought it was all clear. And then you actually started to feel things. Yes. And that's not a mirage. I mean, that's not any. <laughs> Sir, you would have no reason to make this up. And you, and you, well, and, according and to the Department of Defense, you know, <laughs> I'm getting pretty tired of hearing well, that nothing happened. And the, the gentleman you said you, there was someone else in the name. What was the name of that other gentleman where you had that dialogue? Roy Butler. Okay. He served with you? Yes, sir. Okay. And we've had s dozens and dozens of people to testify, written testimony. So it's testimony. not like you came home, you, you were fine while you were there. You actually had an experience. You had these, these sensations at the time. You were concerned about them somewhat yes. at the time. So you put your entire productive gear on. After that point, after Went that point. Went back in the bunker, I mean. Yeah, I hear you. Entire, well, I'd go back in the bunker. By that time, it was too late, really, to be honest with you. Well, it appears so. that might have been the case. When you uh, were discharged from the military, by then you had obviously had some physicals. Uh, when you finally left the military. Well, they kept threatening me. They were going to put me out because I couldn't do the physical yeah. training and all. Yeah. Uh, I'd had, not from the Navy, I didn't have any physicals from the Navy. Okay. And that's who I was asking at that time for help. And the VA, I don't think you want to hear all that. I mean, <coughs> I have no use for them. Have you ever asked to speak to someone like Mr. Joseph and just tell the story to him personally? Mr. Joseph? Mm -hmm. Dr. Joseph? No, I don't think it really do any good, to be honest with you. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to um, ask two more questions of Mr. Martin, and, and um, then I, I appreciate the patience of the committee, and I'll go back if they have any questions. Mr. Martin, you did not go into every bunker, correct? No, sir, we did not. How many bunkers did you go in? I personally went into about three bunkers before I was bored of saying, seeing the same things. My commander went in approximately nine or ten bunkers, and the rest of our unit went into the, the 15 or 17 or so that did not, 13 or 15, that did not have uh, live mines in the doorway. Okay. It is your suspicion that not all the bunkers were checked? I know not all the bunkers were checked. You, you can see in the videotape uh, uh, when we would take the camera up to the doorways of the bunkers to enter, you, you'll see bouncing Betty live uh, uh, landmines. You'll see uh, anti-personnel tank uh, landmines. You'll see, I mean, you'll see all kinds of landmines in the doorways. So we just moved on to the next one. So when the Army tells, when the Defense Department tells us Bunker 73 had chemicals in them, uh, you would be testifying before this committee that they may know that there were in 73, but they can't say there weren't in some other bunkers. Exactly. I, I don't know how they can pinpoint one bunker when we were there and we didn't know it. Yeah. Uh, and they were not there and they know it. Other than when, uh, I guess, the Iraqis gave them a report that said Bunker 73 had 6.5 metric tons of sarin in it. Uh, I don't think the bunkers were large enough to hold 6.5 metric tons unless it was in little test tubes. I don't know. Okay. I didn't see any of those in any of the bunkers. Okay. But if, if Bunker 30 or 73 had sarin in it, then it was either that we were, we, we ourselves put explosives on it and did not know what we were looking at, or we put it around the outside and the top of the bunkers, because there was so many bunkers that we could not get into to wire them. I'm absolutely convinced that if you had not taken the picture, and if, for instance, CBS didn't have the, their picture of the chemical on the shell, mm -hmm. the projectile, that they wouldn't acknowledge it to this day. That's now, what I have told uh, after I testified to your community before. They, when they wanted that videotape, if I would have gave them, if I would have gave them that videotape for the three, three and a half months prior than I gave it to the presidential advisory committee, June twenty-first would have never happened. Now, I know that for a okay, fact. And the final question, because you were asked um, by Mr. Fatah, and I'm a little unclear about this, and it was a very important question he asked. Um, 
Is it your testimony that equipment was set up to detect chemicals and they didn't go off? Uh, can you testify that the equipment was set up to, to, to monitor chemicals? We did not have chemical alarms set up in the area I was sitting at. The guys from the 37th, the soldiers of the 37th, or I mean Alpha Company of the 37th, that claims that they've heard alarms go off, it was a personal call on their part. Sergeant Dan Topolsky. I don't understand personal call. What does personal call mean? Uh, Sergeant Dan Topolsky, uh, who, who was on 60 Minutes also, um, he, he claims that he just took his alarm and held it out the window just for curiosity. Uh, of his you say uh, alarm. Not every soldier has an alarm. Right. Not every one of us. All we had on us as a personal alarm was an M256 kit. Okay. Uh, but see, like I said, the men from Alpha Company was a mile and a half down away from we, us. We have testimony <laughs> that in some places the equipment was never set up to monitor. Right. We, we didn't. So therefore, when the military says that they have no alarms went off, so we shouldn't be concerned, uh, that's not, th th if no alarm went off, that's true. That's the kind of dialogue we have with them sometimes. Right. So that no alarm went off. And then we find out and they knew that no alarms were actually uh, monitoring equipment was set off so alarm could go off. So I'm asking you a question. Mm -hmm. Do, were you around any monitoring equipment? Not during Kamasia. Okay. Not at all during Kamasia. So it wasn't like you were around monitoring equipment and it just was there doing its job and it just didn't go off because there were no chemicals. Not you at just, all. You did not see any monitoring equipment. I did not see any. The colonel never gave an order to, uh, to deploy the MA chemical alarms. Um, uh, even the guys from, 30, or from Alpha Company that heard their alarms go off, I, I've, I'm curious why they didn't get on the radio and warn the rest of us or hit the horns or something. Uh, but my one question, I, I guess, sir, back to you would be, what does it matter if we had alarms or not? The Pentagon's already said 14,000 of them were worthless. So why is it so important now that the alarms went off? There was no alarms. Well... <laughs> There are many answers to that question. Mr. I mean, Shea. if they were all worthless, why, why do they want to okay. say that there was an alarm I'm, that went I, off? A, a short response, and then I'm going to ask if any committee member would like to just ask another question, and I'd be happy to. I know we are keeping witnesses here for a while. Uh, this is a very important hearing, and our feeling is this. You all have waited five years, in some cases, to tell your story. Mr. Martin, you've told it a few times. Uh, but you've all waited a long time, and we want to make sure your story is heard and responded to. Mr. Shays, on the alarms, uh, for an example, in Riyadh, when we were in Riyadh the first nine days, those alarms weren't real loud. We couldn't hear them unless I opened a window, which you really didn't want to do if there was potential for chemical alert and you were in a you know, hard building. You wanted to keep the window closed, but we couldn't hear them so unless heard, we opened open the, the window. You hear the alarm so the chemical can come. So, so my first response, uh, and I remember thinking this, I've got to open the window so I can hear the alarm, but my first response, besides grabbing at my mask, is I'm going to hit the window down yeah. to try to decrease exposure if, if we get the chemicals. Um, there wasn't chemical alarms all throughout theater. Uh, we had to, I begged one off of the NBC people at the Air Force uh, area at KKMC to take forward. I'm not even sure, uh, you know, I turned it over to our NCO, uh, assistant NCO is set up. I'm not even sure if he set it up. I know, you know, I had him go through the training with the NC NBC person. But you couldn't hear those alarms very far. And so if one went off, if they didn't pass a radio message, it didn't get out to the troops. The other thing that I'm trying to get through is that if your troops were under, you know, a low level and it was affecting their neurological function, they wouldn't think, I need to get on the radio. I need to pass a word. We weren't neurologically functioning well under neurotoxins. The whole system was a mess. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what kind of proof you're going to need, but the medical proof is there. We had deaths in theater that, that weren't explored. Let me just ask, uh, and to conclude this panel, uh, Ms. Kaplan, do you have any comment to make to close? I didn't ask you a question, but the, uh, the thing that, you know, there are degrees of outrage, and all of them are pretty high, but the thought that somehow a very small child could be affected by um, um, potentially the, the gear of, of her dad 
uh, and the mom and other children uh, is beyond my comprehension. And um, I, I, do you have any final comment to make any observation? Well, I think when any military person goes to serve his country, he never thinks about his family being a potential victim of his patriotism, if you will. Um, you don't know how many times my husband and I have sat down and thought, what if we didn't do this and what if we didn't do this? It's very hard when people attack your credibility in the military medical system, the CCEP, to be strong within yourself and think, no, I really need to be an advocate for my child. I need to come forward and I need to say, this is wrong and this is what's going on and we need to look into it. Um, this is the burden, sir, that I'll have for the rest of my life. I wasn't intending to give either of you a burden. I, no, no. Uh, no. I, I, my intention, though, is to say that, that your country um, I, I, I'm not sure that there's ever going to be a definitive response from the DOD that everyone is going to feel really warm and fuzzy about. Um, but I do think, like I said before, that accountability needs to be addressed in this issue. And I think that perhaps a GAO IG investigation with subpoena power into a DOD and VA handling of this issue really needs to be looked at. Thank but, you. Thank you. You know, Mr. Towns is a Democrat. I'm a Republican. We don't know. Uh, we may have our suspicions, but we don't know how the elections will turn out, who will be in charge. But the one thing you can all be certain of is that uh, Mr. Towns, who has worked as an equal partner on this issue with, uh, with me and, and the full committee, that we will pursue it uh, even with more vigor uh, in, the, in, the, in the days and months and uh, potentially years to come. So you all have provided an extraordinary service. And I'm going to, with that, uh, conclude this hearing. And I thank you very much. I not this hearing, but this panel. panel. Let me thank also you. Thank yes, the witnesses. Panel. May I also thank the witnesses. I really appreciate you coming and sharing the time with us and telling in terms of uh, your experiences because I'm certain that as we go along and the things that you've said and the things that you've done will help others as well because we're not going to let this issue go. We're going to stick with it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. And while you're all getting up, I'm just going to uh, put into the record, uh, I want to be fair to the Assistant Secretary of Defense who has written us a letter uh, this is um, Assistant Secretary of Defense, the Legislative Affairs, Sandra Stewart, to explain um, the reason why the, the, assist the, the department um, isn't here to testify. Uh, you all are, are free to get up, and I will uh, just call on the next panel. Uh, it's Sylvia Copeland, the Chief uh, for um, Persian Gulf War Veterans Illness Task Force, Central Intelligence Agency, and Dr. Francis Murphy, Environmental Agent Services. Department of Veterans Affairs, and uh, while our next panel is coming, just will, uh, for the record, submit um, this letter in its entirety. Uh, we'll make it available so that um, my coloration of what it says is can be viewed by uh, everyone here. Uh, I just will uh, read the first paragraph. Dear Mr. Chairman, this is dated uh, the 19th. We received it at 10:24. We respectfully decline your invitation to testify before your subcommittee on Thursday, uh, 9th September 1996. As we discussed with your staff, our most appropriate witness, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, Stephen C. Joseph, who had provided testimony at your earlier hearing, would have little new to add to his testimony from his last experience before the subcommittee, and he would not have been able to address some of the specific issues you identified for discussion. While there was subsequent interest in having Dr. Joseph participate, um, in the interim, he accepted a request to testify before the House Committee on Commerce, Subcommittee on Health and Environment's hearing on Medicare subvention uh, at the same time. So he is at another hearing. I'll just um, share my, um, my general impression that there shouldn't just be one person in um, the Department of Defense who is uh, capable and qualified to come and testify before this committee leads me to have the continual concern that only information can come from one source. And uh, frankly, if this committee uh, continues, um, either under Mr. Towns or my leadership, that we will be asking people uh, other than Mr. Joseph to come and testify, because I have to believe that there are more than one person who is working on this issue and is capable to respond. And then secondly, there's reference in the second para paragraph to the fact that uh, there's certain modeling going on. This modeling relates 
to the issue of when the plumes went in the air, which way did the wind blow? Because when our troops were engaged in combat, we had information that uh, said that our troops could uh, destroy certain depots because the wind would blow away from our troops, not for towards our troops. And the question is now, we are relooking at that information. The very company that made the determination that the plumes would go away from our troops is the company now who is looking to see if they were right, which raises tremendous question mark in my mind. And the fact now that the modeling uh, still has problems raises additional question. Um, but in fairness to the secretary, assistant secretary, he is at another place uh, as we conduct this hearing. Um, I'm going to ask both of you to, to um, uh, we need to swear both of our witnesses in. If you would both rise. Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Copeland, you have never testified before this committee, and uh, I correct. thank you for being here. And uh, Dr. Murphy, you have been here twice before, and I know it's uh, not a particularly easy time to come before this committee under certain circumstances. I imagine you have private and public feelings, and uh, you may not uh, take our same assessment. You may take our same assessment uh, uh, in certain ways. So I realize that uh, uh, this... Uh, You've been here three times. You've been very gracious. We've appreciated you being here, um, and we look forward to your testimony as well as yours, uh, uh, Ms. Copeland. And um, I think we'll start uh, with you, Ms. Copeland, and um, thank you very much for being here. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I would like to submit a recently published report that was sent to your uh, subcommittee entitled CIA Report on Intelligence Related to Gulf War Illnesses for the Record, the report of which you have a copy. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's no objection to that, but would you put the mic a little, maybe put it in the front of you. It's a little hard to read sometimes with the mics in the way, but we sure can hear you better. I'm pleased to represent the agency today and to relay our findings pertaining to Gulf War illnesses. Today I will provide our key findings and some recent assessments regarding the presence of chemical agents at Kamasia, Mohammediyat, and Al Musana. CIA concludes that Iraq did not use chemical agents, nor were any agents located in Kuwait. In addition, on the basis of intelligence information available and modeling to date, we assess that U.S. troops were not exposed to chemical agent released by aerial bombing of Iraqi facilities. However, we have identified and will discuss potential fallout concerns in the case of a rear area chemical weapons storage bunker in southern Iraq. There's also a set of uh, figures that have been handed to the committee, and I'll refer to those as I go through the testimony. If you look at figure one first, please, we conclude that Iraq had chemical weapons at two sites within the Kuwaiti theater of operations. Chemical weapons were destroyed by U.S. forces at one of these, the Kamasia ammunition storage area. Both Kamasia and the second site, An Nasiriya, were large rear area depots near the northern boundary of the Kuwaiti theater of operations in Iraq and stored mostly conventional munitions. If you look at figure two, Unscom inspected chemical munitions at or near Kamasia in October 1991 and identified 122 millimeter sarin cyclosarin nerve agent filled rockets and 155 mustard rounds. At the time, it was not clear whether the chemical weapons identified had been present <coughs> during the war or were, as suspected at other locations, the Iraqis had moved the munitions after the war and just prior to the 1991 UNSCOM inspection. This uncertainty was only cleared up through the recent comprehensive review of intelligence information and an UNSCOM inspection in May 1996 at Kamasiya. Iraq told the May 1996 UNCOM, UNSCOM inspectors that Iraq had moved 2,160 unmarked 122 millimeter nerve agent rockets to Bunker 73 from the Al Musana CW production and storage facility just before the start of the air war. According to Iraq, during the air war, they moved about 1,100 rockets 
from that bunker to the pit area two, two kilometers away. Iraq told UNSCOM in May 1996 that they believed occupying coalition forces also destroyed some pit area rockets. DOD's investigation into this possibility has indicated that U.S. soldiers destroyed stacks of crated munitions in the pit on 10 March 1991. We are working with the investigative team to determine the number of rockets destroyed in order to model the potential hazard resulting from this destruction. We plan to finish our analysis on the pit in the coming weeks. During the May 1996 inspection, Iraq also told UNSCOM that the 6,155 millimeter mustard rounds UNSCOM found in the open area at Kamasia in October 1991 had been stored at one bunker at an Nasiriya until 15 February 1991, just before the ground war. Iraq claims that fears of coalition bombing motivated an Nasiriya depot personnel to move the intact mustard rounds to the open area five kilometers from the Kamasiya depot where the rounds were camouflaged with canvas. Subsequently, we have been able to confirm that the munitions were moved to this area about this time. <coughs> Modeling of the potential hazard caused by the destruction of Bunker 73, you can look at in Figure 3, indicates that an area around the bunker, at least two kilometers in all directions and four kilometers downwind, could have been contaminated at or above the level causing acute symptoms including runny nose, headache, and meiosis. An area up to 25 kilometers downwind could have contaminated at a much lower general, general population dosage limit. Based on wind models and observations of a video and photographs of destruction activity at Kamasia, we determined that, she determined that the downwind direction was northeast to east. Some of the modeling assumptions we used were based on data from U.S. testing in 1966 that involved destruction of several bunkers filled with GB rockets of similar maximum range to the Iraqi rockets found in Bunker 73. On the basis of all available information, we conclude that coalition aerial bombing resulted in damage to filled chemical munitions at only two facilities, Mohammadiyat and Al Musana. Both are located in remote areas west of Baghdad. Our modeling indicates that fallout from these facilities did not reach troops in Saudi Arabia. According to the most recent Iraqi declarations, less than 5% of Iraq's approx approximately 700 metric tons of chemical agent stockpile was destroyed by coalition bombing. At Mohammadiyat storage area, Iraq declared that 200 mustard filled and 12 sarin-filled aerial bombs were damaged or destroyed by coalition bombing. We have modeled the contaminated area resulting from bombing of Mohammadiyat, a site which is at least 410 kilometers from U.S. troops stationed at Rafa and even further from the bulk of U.S. troops. Bombing of this facility started on 19 January and continued throughout the air war. Analysis of all available information leads us to conclude that the earliest chemical munition destruction date at Mohammadiyat is 22 January. Based on recent Iraqi declarations, we have modeled release of 2.9 metric tons of sarin and 15 metric tons of mustard for all the possible bombing dates. For these days, as for the whole time period of the bombing, southerly winds occur only in a few days. Figures 6 and 7 show the maximum downwind dispersions in the general southerly direction for sarin and mustard cut off at about 300 and 130 kilometers, respectively. Neither the first effects nor the general population limit levels reach U.S. troops that were stationed in Saudi Arabia. At Al Musana, the primary Iraqi CW production and storage facility, Iraq declared that 2,500 chemical rockets containing about 17 metric tons of sarin nerve agent had been destroyed by coalition bombing. UNSCOM inspectors were unable to verify the exact numbers because of damage to the rockets. Analysis of all available information leads us to conclude that the earliest chemical munition destruction at, this bu at the bunker that was destroyed at Al Musana is 6 February. Of the days that the bunker at Musana 
could have been bombed, winds were southerly on only 8 February. Figure 8 shows that, for the general population limit dosage, the most southerly dispersion on 8 February is 160 kilometers, again well short of U.S. troops. Finally, we have found no information that would lead us to conclude or suggest that casualties occurred inside Iraq as a result of CW agents released from the bombing of these two facilities. This is probably because these two facilities are in remote locations, far from any population centers. The Mohammadiyat and Al Muthana sites are both over 30 kilometers from the nearest Iraqi towns. We will continue to be vigilant in tracking any lead that surfaces in the future. If we find any information pointing to chemical or biological agent exposures or impacting significantly on the issue of, of Gulf War veterans' illnesses, we again will work with the Department of Defense to announce those findings. Thank you, Ms. Copeland. Ms. Murphy? Dr. Murphy, I'm sorry. That's okay. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, Thank you for inviting me here today to be, appear before the subcommittee and update you on important clinical and research developments related to Persian Gulf War veterans. I apologize. Um, I was originally scheduled to be on the fourth panel this afternoon with the scientists and medical experts. I'm not an investigation expert. I am not an intelligence. And therefore, my comments will be focused on research and medical issues. Uh, I am currently the director of the VA's Environmental Agents Service. I'm a neurologist and previously the director of VA's Persian Gulf Referral Center in Washington, D.C. Shortly after the return from Southwest, the Southwest Asia Theater of Operations, veterans of Operation Desert Shield and De Desert Storm began to report a variety of symptoms and illnesses. In response to the, need, to the needs of these wartime veterans, the Department of Veterans Affairs developed its first health care programs for Persian Gulf veterans beginning in 1991 and 1992. The department has continuously improved and expanded these programs to encompass a comprehensive four-pronged approach to Persian Gulf veterans programs, addressing relevant medical care, research, compensation, and outreach and education uh, issues. VA provides Persian Gulf registry health examinations referral center evaluations, and specialty, uh, special eligibility for priority outpatient and inpatient health care to Persian Gulf War veterans. To date, more than 60,000 Persian Gulf veterans have completed registry exams. Almost 187,000 have been seen in ambulatory care clinics, and more than 18,000 have been admitted to VA medical facilities. Of those veterans participating in our registry programs, they have commonly reported to us that they suffer from fatigue, skin rash, headaches, muscle and joint pain, memory loss, shortness of breath, sleep disturbances, diarrhea, and other gastrointestinal complaints, and chest pain, a group of symptoms that have become uh, very familiar to those of us who deal with Persian Gulf veterans. However, another 12 percent of our registry participants are asymptomatic, but they do come to VA looking for advice from physicians because they're concerned uh, that there might be possible future consequences resulting from their service in the Persian Gulf. It's important to recognize that numerous, scienti numerous scientists and advisory committees have concluded that there are many types of different illnesses, including a, well, a, a wide variety of well-defined medical and psychiatric conditions being diagnosed in Persian Gulf veterans participating in the VA, DOD, and other health surveillance programs. VA physicians report that a small number of Persian Gulf veterans have unexplained illnesses. Unfortunately, uh, we have not been able to give a medical diagnosis to every veteran who comes into our health care facilities. Indeed, the current information suggests, however, that no single unique illness is the cause of all illnesses in Persian Gulf veterans and we have not been able to identify, as yet, a Gulf War syndrome. VA's research programs related to Persian Gulf veterans' illnesses include more than 30 individual research projects being carried out nationwide by VA and university-affiliated investigators. VA established three environmental hazards research centers in 1994. 
All three centers are carrying out projects which address certain aspects of potential adverse health outcomes of possible exposure of Persian Gulf veterans to neurotoxins. In addition, VA's Environmental Epidemiology Service has completed a mortality study and the first phase of the National Health Survey of Persian Gulf veterans and their families. Details of these and other federally uh, sponsored research studies are included in the report, Federally Sponsored Research on Persian Gulf Veterans Illness for 1995. In May, VA announced that it would establish a fourth environmental hazards research center. This center will study adverse reproductive health effects in uh, Persian Gulf, Vietnam, and veterans of other areas which may be associated with military occupational exposures. The proposals were due to the VA's Research and Development Service on September 16th, and awards will be made for those proposals before the end of 1996. We'll keep the committee updated on uh, the progress of this activity. I'd like to take this opportunity to give you an overview of um, the progress of several major epidemiology studies. The first is the Persian Gulf War Veterans Mortality Study. This study analyzes all deaths of uh, 696,000 Persian Gulf War veterans who served in the theater of operations between uh, August of 1990 and April of 1991. And it compares them to a group of over 700,000 veterans who served elsewhere during that period. The uh, study demonstrates a significant excess in deaths in Persian Gulf veterans due to external causes, such as accidental deaths uh, due to automobile accidents, but does not uh, demonstrate a difference in death rates due to medical conditions including deaths due to malignant cancers. The results of this and other uh, scientific studies <laughs> together so far suggest that Persian Gulf veterans as a group do not appear to be suffering from life-threatening medical conditions. The, Persian, uh, the National Health Survey of Persian Gulf veterans and their families is being carried out by VA's Environmental Epidemiology Service. The Phase I postal survey of 15,000 Gulf War veterans and a comparison group of 15,000 Gulf era veterans was completed in August. The questions on this survey asked veterans to report health complaints, medical conditions, and a variety of possible environmental exposures, including, importantly, potential nerve gas, mustard gas, and biological warfare exposure. The adjusted response rates for Phase I of this survey were 56%. Phase two will consist of 8,000 telephone interviews and a review of 4,000 medical records. Phase two will address the potential non-response bias and provide a more stable estimate of the prevalence of various health complaints and outcomes. The protocol is being reviewed to determine uh, if revisions are indicated based on our new knowledge of potential low-level chemical exposures. Peer review is be being provided by a subcommittee of VA's Persian Gulf Expert Advisory Committee. Unfortunately, it's too early to discuss the results of this study as we've just begun our analysis of the phase one results. In January of 1994, I'll try to speed up. Uh, let, me, let me say that that red light can be turned off. I've, I wanted all our witnesses to make their full statement, and I don't want you to feel rushed. This thank is you. important. Uh, Tom, if you just, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, in January of 1994, uh, the secretaries of VA, DOD, and HHS established the Persian Gulf Veterans Coordinating Board to provide interdepartmental coordination and direction of federal programs related to Persian Gulf veterans. The Coordinating Board provides interdepartmental means to share clinical and program information on Persian Gulf veterans' issues and to effectively allocate available resources and provide a means of disseminating new research information. VA plays a central role in the Persian Gulf Veterans Coordinating Board through its participation in the clinical research, compensation, and benefits working groups. In particular, the research working group provides guidance and coordination for VA, DOD, and HHS research activities related to Persian Gulf War veterans' health. It coordinates all studies conducted and sponsored by these three departments to prevent unnecessary duplication and ensure that important gaps in scientific knowledge are identified. The, research, the working group is actively involved in directing resources towards high-priority questions and monitoring the results of federally sponsored research programs. 
I'd like to give you one example this afternoon of the coordinating board's proactive role in relevant research administration. This is uh, a prioritization of the federal government's federal, if, of the federal and non-federal research proposals submitted for funding uh, pursuant to the DOD's broad agency announcement. The American Institute of Biologic Science provided an independent peer review of the 11, uh, 111 proposals submitted. The research working group reviewed those proposals, judged to be scientifically meritorious by the American Institute of Biologic Science, and prioritized them according to relevance and the potential to fill research gaps in the existing Persian Gulf research portfolio. Twelve research projects encompassing, encompassing the area of reproductive outcomes, toxicology of peritostigmine bromide, modeling of respiratory toxicant exposures from tent heaters, psychological outcomes, leishmaniasis, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and neuromuscular uh, function were given high priority for funding by the research working group. Importantly, studies of low-level chemical warfare exposure were not given high priority <coughs> in either the BAA proposal process or in the 1995 working plan because military and intelligence sources had stated that U.S. troops had not been exposed to chemical agents. The research program was designed around the available information, and we had no available information about chemical exposures. The coordinating board, however, immediately revised its initial action plan when the possibility of nerve agent exposure in southern Iraq became known. We believe that the actions taken by the research working group have strengthened and improved our research portfolio related to Persian Gulf veterans issues. VA, through the research working group of the coordinating board, has developed an action plan to address possible long-term health consequences of low-level exposure to chemical warfare nerve agents and mustard gas based on the DOD's announcements regarding the demolition of chemical munitions bunkers and the destruction of a pit containing sarin and cyclosarin at Camasilla. The VA has always remained open to the possibility of Persian Gulf veterans being exposed to a wide variety of hazardous agents while serving in Southwest Asia, including chemical warfare agents. Prior to DOD's announcement on June 21, 1996, VA designed its clinical uniform case assessment protocol to detect clinical signs and symptoms related to neurotoxic exposures. In addition, VA established a pilot program at the VA Medical Center in Birmingham to evaluate potential reports of a group of, of Persian Gulf veterans from Alabama, Ten Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia who reported concerns about poor health, which they attributed to the effects of low-level chemical warfare exposure. These evaluations um, did not reveal any neuropathologic process typically associated with neurotoxin, neurotoxin exposure. DOD's announcement regarding the demolitions at Camasilla has spurred VA to focus more attention on the possible effects of very low-level chemical exposures. Dr. Kaiser has asked the research working group of the coordinating board to, plan, to provide a plan for addressing this issue as a component of the 1996 working plan for research. As it stands now, the research working group has recommended an action plan to fund toxicologic research proposals on low-level chemical weapons exposure from a pool of already reviewed proposals submitted through a competitive process to the Army. Second. They will solicit proposals, research on fe the feasibility of conducting epidemiologic investigations of low-level level chemical agent effects. And thirdly, they will review the ability to confirm the identities and location of individuals in and around Camasilla with the goal of soliciting an epidemiologic investigation, if appropriate. Based on the Coordinating Board's recommendations, $2.5 million have already been allocated to three new peer-reviewed basic science research projects in this area, and an additional $2.5 million has been identified for these future studies. Funding for these new efforts will come from the VA-DOD Collaborative Biomedical Research Program. It's important to note that research related to the service in the Persian Gulf War is highly complex. It encompasses many disciplines and numerous, uh, presents numerous challenges. 
VA is committed to meeting these challenges and obtaining the most accurate answers concerning the health of Persian Gulf veterans and their families. Answers to our research questions will take time, and concentrated efforts are being made to identify important answers to our current gaps in knowledge. Yet, we should be encouraged by the significant advances we have already made in our understanding of some of the complex er issues in this field. I'm personally convinced that the research studies underway and the additional studies under development will lay a firm foundation for clinical care for Persian Gulf veterans. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that concludes my testimony. I appreciate the extra time, and I'd be happy to address any, any questions. I thank both of you. Your, your testimony is, um, uh, in some cases, uh, talking about different issues. One's talking about exposure, detection and exposure, and others talking about effects, but they are all connected. And um, that would be part of my interest in pursuing the questions I have. We knew that Iraq had uh, chemical and bio biological weapons. There, there's not a member of Congress that didn't know that they were developing and producing both chemical and biological weapons. We knew that before the war. We knew that they stationed, uh, uh, they had these um, chemicals and biological weapons in more than one place. Uh, there are other things that you and I know. But it, it didn't take really a brain scientist to know that they had it. Uh, they had the capability, and we also know they had the experience because they used it in defensive mode more than offensive with the Iranians, but they used it. And we know they used it on their own citizens, the Kurds. So we, 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 we entered the war with a lot of knowledge about chemical, the potential for chemical or biological uh, weapons being used. Capability experience. Now, the next issue is, was there detection? And um, I'd like to ask you, Ms. Copeland, if uh, you can respond to the whole issue of detection. Equipment going off, pe soldiers saying, you know, uh, the, 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 there were warning signs. We had witnesses here, a witness in particular talking about being in, in a bunker just, you know, with his mask on, and then later coming up then feeling the effects, running down, putting his suit and mask on. Um, we had testimony at other hearings, and uh, I'm certain the CIA has, has reviewed that as well, um, saying that soldiers heard the alarms go off. Can you respond to that issue? Those are operational type questions. I'm an intelligence officer. We reviewed all of the intelligence information. Uh, DOD's investigative team reviews all of the operational information. Well, let me ask you this, the intelligence information, and, and I'm not, this is my ignorance, uh, perhaps. Um, intelligence means that you try to find out certain things. What was your charge? I mean, w w wasn't it important to find out if, if uh, there was, in fact, um, uh, chemical weapons being used, either offensively or, or uh, being blown up and coming over our troops, isn't that something that you would seek out? Isn't that part of your intelligence okay. work? Yes, we reviewed all of the information from our variety of sources and look at it. The information on the ground, the operational information, DOD has a responsibility to review that. Well, if you have soldiers who are claiming that they had equipment go off, you wouldn't have interviewed them? It is not our job to interview U.S. soldiers. The reason why the CIA and the DOD investigative team work together, because we each have different responsibilities. We review all of the intelligence information from I, I a need, variety I need, of sources. I need the term intelligence. It doesn't seem very intelligent not to get all the information you can get. And, and I just, I need you to define what you mean by intelligence information. Does it mean, well, you def define it for me. We have information from a variety of sources. And that information we put together. We are not in the business of intervie interviewing U.S. soldiers. That is DOD's job. We work with them. When they find something out that's important to the investigation, they pass it on to us. But, but so our intelligence means when we find something out, we pass it on to them. We share the information. Each one of us has different responsibilities. Going over troop logs, interviewing soldiers is not one of our responsibilities. That doesn't seem very intelligent. 
Who no, it doesn't. Foreign it, information from foreign sources. So your information comes from foreign sources. That's correct. Okay. Or or technical means, but. So basically, your your statements here are almost meaningless then, because you're telling me that uh, you can only check with foreign sources, but when we have our own troops who claim they're exposed to chemicals, you're not allowed to talk to them. We work with the DOD investigative team. They pass on the information. We have worked very hard since March 95 to gather all the information, look at everything we can, and pass that information on. We take it very seriously and have worked very hard. Ma'am, I know you work hard and I know you take it very seriously. I work hard and I take my job seriously. But that's, that, that's not good enough. We all have to be logical about this. There is a gigantic breakdown, a gigantic breakdown, and everyone is able to, to kind of find bureaucratic protection. And in the process, we have soldiers who are ill, soldiers who are dying, and children who are feeling the effects of that both personally in terms of their own physical experiences. So um, we're trying to sort out how we resolve these issues. If it's, there's nothing intelligent to me about not making sure you have all the information. And so is it, um, it are you saying to me, and you may have requirements under law uh, that I am responsible for. Let me just say, Ms. Murphy has appeared before us three times. I can throw stones, I, have, I can look back and say you should have done something. I can also say that I didn't get into this issue until two years ago. So I mean, I feel that I have a role on all sides of this. And it is not my intention to, to, to throw stones. But it, 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 what I'm hearing to me is an absurdity. Help me sort it out. Are you allowed to interview Americans about information and intelligence they may have about the use of chemicals? That is the DOD's responsibility. We work with them. The way that, the, the way that we've divided up this problem, we look at the intelligence. OK, they, now, they now did you, is that your decision to. to divide it up? I mean, is it, is it a, a, did I, as a member of Congress, prevent you from start talking to a, 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 our own side? I can get back to you on specifics okay. on, on legally what we can do and we can't if you're but the interested. bottom line is that you didn't interview any of our the soldiers. The bottom line is we did not, in, we did not uh, go to any veterans and ask them any questions. We did have one of our people present when uh, DOD in, talked to one of the individuals, but it is not our job to go out and contact them. Now, the DOD has their own intelligence units. Um, how do you interact with them? They're part of the intelligence community, and, and we work with them. And, and uh, the, the director, Mr. Deutsch, is in charge of those units as well, uh, uh, indirectly. He coordinates their activities. He is the director of uh, the intelligence community, right. the CIA, which includes intelligence community. Just uh, then, let me back up. What value is your testimony here today? What 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 should I, what should I um, uh, take as helpful information? We have looked into the issue. In September '95, looked into well, we what? started in March. Looked into what issue? Looked into the issue of Iraqi use, of where the chemical weapons were located. Okay. When they were bombed, where chemical weapons are located uh, when U.S. troops went into the Kuwaiti theater of operations. We began our intensive look into this situation or, or into the Gulf War illnesses in March 1995. We identified Kamasia as an area that needed further investigation when in September 95. At that time, we worked with DOD to sort out uh, whether, in fact, this facility, number one, had chemical munitions present but in See, it. the problem is our troops knew there were chemicals there in 91. The Defense Department didn't acknowledge it until 96. And you all were looking at it in 95. I mean, it would just seem logical to me that um, we would talk to our own people. In 1991, Kamasia was not considered a depot that had chemical weapons in it. By, to my knowledge. By the CIA and by the Department of Defense, but not by our soldiers who were there, who took pictures. 
and who tried to tell people that there were chemical weapons there. And we had individuals, such as individual testified before this committee, talking about sirens going off, putting on headgear, coming back up. Uh, when Mr. Roberts testified, saying that he had the effects of chemical weapons. And he could describe it. And, 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 and so what I'm understanding is, that, so who's going to listen to that person? Mr. Roberts. The pictures that we've seen that were on 60 Minutes were not chemical munitions. They were? I haven't seen any with bands on them that were chemical munitions. Those were, and you can look it up in Jane's, it took us a few minutes, uh, UK Hesh munitions. Mm -hmm. They did not contain chemical agents to our knowledge. The chemical munitions that were located in Commissaire were 122 two millimeter rounds that had no markings on them as far as any color code. Now, um, you have total comfort level that all the bunkers were looked at? Or was that defense? I. From all the information we have, no, uh, that's there not were good several. No, let me just no, 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 stop, stop, stop. From all the information we have, is like if I don't ask for the information and if I don't seek it out, the answer is just going to be a negative, negative. and that's what my problem is. I mean, if you don't, if you simply choose not to find the information, then you ha don't have the information. So, I mean, I, that's that, that's a statement I have a hard time with. From all the information you had. Now, the question I'm asking you is, do you have confidence that every one of those bunkers was looked at to make sure there were no chemical weapons? I do not know if all of them were looked at. The only ones that we've been able to identify as actually having chemical munitions in them is Bunker 73. Also, the pit area that we described and another area, which is in the Kamasia, um Depot, and which the, contained and the mustard for, rounds. And the basis for determining Bunker 73 had the chemical weapons is what? The basis of that, the confirmation of chemical munitions at Kamasia was based on an UNSCOM inspection in May 1996, where they went in and were able to identify all of the characteristics of chemical munitions from the rubble. May I ask you something? You used the word confirmation. Is that a word that I should be suspicious of? In September 95, when this came up, again, we began March 95 looking at it as an area that we needed to investigate further. We became more convinced that it was chemical agents. We wanted to make sure. But I don't understand the term more convinced. Even if you were a little convinced, we would do something, correct? Or do we have to be more convinced? When we I, saw I, I'm, this taught to, I'm taught to listen to your words very carefully right. because when your boss testified, didn't testify, answered questions on 60 Minutes, he said there was no offensive use of chemical weapons, which was about as meaningless a statement as anyone could make. Because we're not talking about offensive use of chemical weapons. We're talking about chemical weapons. And we're talking about our own side blowing up chemical weapons. We're talking about our troops being three miles away. And we're talking about the fact that 12 miles away, they had projectiles coming out. So we're not just talking about the plume that went into the air and which way did it blow that you're talking about in the study. We're talking about the fact they were on shells being projectiled out somewhere, projected out far away. And, and so when I hear, you know, more confidence and confirmation and so on, it seems to me that we got to get before confirmation. If you suspect possibly there may have been chemical weapons, our troops and the VA should be notified about it. That's and if correct. we are going to wait for confirmation, then we'll wait five, six, seven years. We notified DOD on, in September 95 when we first suspected this site at the beginning of the investigation of this particular facility. I, I just want to say that with all due respect, I'm not impressed with that statement. Um, we're going to come back. I think we have a vote, and, and uh, we'll have you uh, start us off. Do we have a vote now? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, we have a vote. And I think what I'm going to do is uh, say that we will be back here at 2.30. Uh, if someone wants to get something to eat or something, we'll be at, back at 2.30 and we'll help you all out. This, this stands at recess.
At this point, the committee went on to hear from Veterans Affairs and Pentagon officials. This hearing will air this weekend. Check our schedule update tonight for air times. Recently, the Pentagon announced that possible exposures to biological and or chemical agents could have occurred during military operations in the Gulf. More information on these announcements may be found by contacting the Pentagon's internet website. Here's a look at Friday's campaign calendar. President Clinton and Vice President Gore will be wrapping up their Western bus tour in 